can you hear me? Is there a microphone?
right, everyone. Let us get started. Uh, we have to get started because it's also being live streamed. You do not want people to wait over there uh, in the virtual space. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Brumar Mukherjee. I am the chair of Michigan Biostatistics. I have been chair for the last six years. I'm in the last hours of my chairpersonship, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Michigan Biostatistics. It has been my absolute privilege and honor to be the chair of this department, one of the oldest departments of biostatistics in the world. Uh, when was Michigan Biostatistics established? Any ideas? Guesses? The nearest neighbor gets an award or something like that? Any, any show of hands? Yes, please. 1970, 1970, next guess. Close, not quite there. 1957. 1949 is the answer. We are, uh, so you are closest, nearest neighbor. I'll keep you in mind for, uh, uh, for an honor. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, 1949, that means 75 years of existence. And this is one of the campuses where uh, the statistics department is younger uh, than the biostatistics department by 20 years. Uh, we always say that we are older and wiser. Uh, but, uh, but many of you are probably considering statistics as well, but I think that it is fantastic to see this enthusiasm for our profession uh, in statistics and biostatistics. So I, I have this sort of like, you know, feeling that like, you know, I have to do better than GPT-4. So I asked like chat GPT and GPT-4 that like, what is your advice for graduate students in biostatistics? And uh, the first line is very interesting. As an AI language model, I don't have personal experiences or emotions, uh, which is very important, right? That's where I felt like I could do better, right? To show you some of my personal experience and emotion. But what they said as an advice is actually quite good. Stay motivated, uh, develop good study habits, network and collaborate, keep up to date with the latest research, Communicate effectively, seek our mentor, seek your mentors, and take care of yourself. I think these are pretty good advice as a graduate student or for a faculty, uh, for early career researchers, these are pretty good advice. So what could I tell you that is not achievable or Googleable or searchable? That's my, again, my own unique personal journey and experience. So I went to grad school at Purdue Statistics. I'm not going to tell you when, but it sort of like reveals that I was at a first major conference in 1999. That it reveals my age, but I'm proud. So uh, our statistics department, and it was a very theoretical statistics department. There is no data. In my dissertation, there is absolutely no data. My advisor prohibited that. And so uh, uh, we were in a math department building. So our really dream was very altruistic. I mean, there are many people who wanted to solve the Riemann hypothesis. And so changing the mathematical universe was over coffee and pie. That was my grad school. But the grad school for me was really a window into the world. In my office, there was a person from Germany. There was a person from Korea. There was a person from United States. We got to know each other's culture each other's favorite food, and who we are through people, different countries, the window into the world. The second big part, and I do not recommend it, was actually being a graduate student and a parent. So what happened was that uh, my daughter was born in the second uh, year of grad school. So this is truly the blackboard taken from the office of my grad school, where I spent the whole day working on some very tedious and tenacious equations, and then I stepped out, and someone just wiped it off and repainted a flower over it. <laughs> and that's really my daughter, and that's really the couch in my office, which we fought over. The person who actually got earliest to the office got the couch. So uh, this is what grad school was about. And my daughter was always babysat and taken care of by smart graduate students. When you're poor, people actually help you. So there was something really, really sm fascinating 
fascinating about being poor and like you know the proletariat, not the bourgeois. So, um, and so I think that it was like a village, a village of international students raising each other and supporting each other. So these two people are phenomenal statisticians and they are in different parts of the world. And I was really not a good graduate student. So I'm encouraging you to embrace your failures, your struggles. Uh, my thesis was uh, on optimal design for estimating the path of a stochastic process. I don't do anything remotely related to a single word of that uh, dissertation. So this is my advisor, uh, Professor Bill Studden. <coughs> So this is a before and after picture, after my PhD and before my PhD. Professor Studden was a wonderful person. He graduated with Samuel Carlin, who is the father of probability and stochastic process from Stanford, and got his job at Purdue. And from 1964 to till then, he retired, stayed in the same job and same office. So I was quite different. So it was a very interesting conversation between me and Professor Studden. But after years of toughness, and like I do not have a single co-authored paper with my advisor, and we can talk about that story in my personal room, um, but he then finally accepted me as a Facebook friend. I was one of his three Facebook friends, and I'm very, very <laughs> proud of that. Uh, Professor Studden passed away a few years ago, and you know, you, I, I had the sense of being orphaned in the United States, because regardless of how tough he was, uh, he was my academic parent. So um, what I did in graduate school, I was very passionate about leadership, and I was very passionate about uh, communication, that I should be able to communicate my technical work to a broader audience. And I found two amazing female mentors and role models, the first female chair at Purdue Statistics, Mary Ellen Bach on the left-hand side, and Professor Rebecca Dodge, who was the dean at Carnegie Mellon and now the provost at RPI. And these, she was an assistant professor. And you know, when you're an assistant professor, then graduate students are your friends because senior faculty do not pay attention to you. So I and Rebecca bonded a lot, and I always feel till this day, every career move that I take, I am the chair, she's the dean, so she's N plus one for me. And so I always text her and say, is this what I something I should do? So it's very, very important to cultivate those relationships. So networking is very important. And I really think grad school is not about academics. Grad school is really about friendship. Friendship with a group of people, and you can see that we have aged, some of us gracefully, some of us not so much. Uh, and so every year, at, uh, at uh, the joint statistical meetings, which is our biggest conference. How many of you have been to JSM? Yes, so, um, so, so this we get together because Purdue has an alumni reception, just like Michigan does. So you become a part of a community. That's what grad school was about. And that's what I think ChatGPT missed because it doesn't have emotional and personal experiences. So, Coming back from me to Ann Arbor, what grad school is all about, Ann Arbor is the most beautiful city in the world. And you can see that this is the center, which is my favorite. I really like a lot of art and uh, cinema. And Michigan Theater and State Theater, where I spend most of my time when I'm not looking at a computer. And the sky in Ann Arbor is always blue. Look at it, outside, like it's never gray. Um, you can quantify that. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the School of Public Health, because many of you <coughs> are probably coming from a, a school of like you know, in engineering or College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. School of Public Health is structured slightly differently. So the departments are not physics, chemistry, and mathematics. The departments are epidemiology, environmental health, health behavior and health education, health management and policy. So it's important for you to situate yourself in the school. Because many of us coming from a math stat background often think, what am I doing in terms of my peers in other departments in the school? But it has been really inspiring and liberating to learn from non-quantitative scientists in all, in to, to identify important issues in public health. So you can see that the, we call ourselves the rocking chairs. The chairs form a very close-knit group, and we have amazing leadership at the school. And our dean happens to be a biostatistician and an alum of the department. 
So he understands our challenges and that it has been a pleasure to work with a dean who is biostatistician. Biostatistics leadership, and as I said, that I grew up with seeing a lot of strong uh, female mentors, and I uh, enjoy working in a team of, with two brilliant women. Kelly is here, Associate Chair for Academic Affairs, and uh, Professor Lu Wang, and who you are going to see later on. And we have a lot of fun together discussing many different aspects of life. Uh, this is all of us, all of the faculty, as I said, that this is not just the oldest, but one of the largest, finest, and kindest biostatistics departments. And we take pride in the last word, uh, kindest. Uh, we have a lot of faculty, and last year we recruited nine more. So we uh, really, really faculty are working in various different areas and mentoring students, and students are a big part of the research. Current students too many to fit. And so if you zoom in, zoom in, it's going to just go to a microscopic level. So just give, let me give you some number, 262 students from around the world. And we are an international community of scholars, and it has always been so. People from all over the world have come to Michigan Biostatistics for their training. So our mission, our mission um, is really in terms of providing high quality training and education to the next generation of biostatistics students. Our graduate program is rated very, very high. And as you probably know that, you know, our department is also ranked quite high in terms of the major biostatistics department. And one reason is that the graduate students and the alums. Uh, we also consult very widely across campus, bringing biostatistical design and analysis expertise to the campus and to a wide spectrum of health-related issue. But being in a school of public health, most of our work is related to health. It's not, it's not um, un uncommon it, or it's not rare that somebody works in a social science project or an economics project, but rarely they all have some kind of connotation and implication for human health. And I think that our faculty and staff work on important areas of current biostatistics research, developing new methodology, but we also consult and collaborate widely and extensively. We are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the data science workforce. And overall, we want to be, and we thrive to be, an intellectually vibrant and socially progressive community. Our areas of strength, and many of you have actually written these areas, some of these areas, um, they are, some of them are quite classical, missing data, longitudinal data, survival analysis, this is classic bread and butter biostatistics, but then on top of that, there are emerging areas, electronic health records, environmental statistics, um, in terms of big data, data integration, new areas are emerging. And I'm not going to quite put artificial intelligence there because I do not think faculty are working as much on Gen AI model. That research is coming, and I'm happy to take questions on that because I think you probably are interested. So along with our academic goals and metrics and numbers, it's very, very important that we walk into this room, this space, this department, this school with some shared values. And what are our shared values? We definitely want to encourage bold exploration of idea, not playing it safe. Purposeful inclusion, doing a work for the broader good, collaborative spirit, not just competition, and self-determination and well-being. These are our values, and I think often in academia we get lost in terms of goals and metrics and forget our values, and that's something that I want to remind all of you. Now, what does a chair do? This is a chair's uh, message. So uh, a chair keeps the trains running, and sometimes Ann Arbor does look like that. I lied. Um, and, and, and in the winter and in the summer, but a chair also creates new directions and destination for the community that they belong to, uh, for their students, for staff, for faculty. And in my first, uh, when I became chair in 2018, uh, I had a Vision 2020, a three-year program, and I wanted to enhance our curriculum. Uh, I wanted to strongly support and bolster our research computing infrastructure. I wanted the department to have a better culture, integrative department, uh, impactful research, not just like, you know, published in high-tier journals, really translated to practice and impactful. 
uh, have a distributed form of leadership where students are stakeholders in the governance of the department and also strong biostatistic footprint. Uh, so even, you know, um, right now I hold a position in the Office of Vice President of Research and my office is very close to the university president and the provost. And uh, it is a unique opportunity to say that biostatistics and data science is important to the university leadership and across the university. Uh, in post-COVID, of course, during nobody wants to be chair during COVID, let me tell you that. But I could not predict, I'm not such a good forecaster, so COVID happened and we persevered. But post-COVID, we really came up uh, with a different kind of vision in the late, later like three-year term, the last three-year term, in terms of working really closely on our climate, uh, enhanced mentoring, and we can talk a lot about that, and the mentoring cross-cutting through peer mentoring, graduate student mentoring, faculty mentoring, and also leadership. We have a new professional development course where uh, we talk a lot about leadership in professional, scientific leadership, community leadership, and we also have student awards that reward outreach and citizenship and leadership. So uh, one part of the curriculum enhancement was this master's in health data science, and so we started with the concentration first, and that was successful and quite in demand. So we went for a full master's program. The first cohort uh, started last year with 16 students. This year we received about 145 applications for this program and uh, the jury is still out how many of them are going to come here. So uh, Big Data Summer Institute, this is our flagship undergraduate summer research program and many of you are here. I'm just loving all of you and it feels like children have come back home. Uh, this is the best thing I have ever like pursued or tried in my career and we have been running that for the last nine years. We have trained 326 soldiers in data science and they are changing the world, one theorem, one algorithm, or one and wrong code at a time. Uh, so, but, so uh, but, but you know, this has been, a, many of you are coming from that program, you know that again, it's not just about scholarship, it's about community. I think that our department stands out in terms of providing computing support to the students. Uh, we have a two full-time in-house computing support person. One uh, develops R packages because many times you know you write R codes, they remain in your GitHub, but you don't go the extra mile to convert that into a package and a, a vignette. So um, Mike um, um, Klein Sasser is our R package and he's a wonderful person. And then uh, Jacob, is coming and Dan Barker was our uh, cluster support person but uh, he left for a fantastic job uh, but Jacob is coming from next Monday uh, really assist people with high performance computing and cluster computing. So we have a department software page and I strongly encourage you to actually go and uh, go to the departmental web page and biostatistics computing resources software and you can see the incredible amount of software and tools faculty are developing. You can search by area, you can search by faculty. This is our product, right? Like if people ask you that, what do you do which is democratized, which is going to be used by others? So software is one currency which we know because technical papers are after all for a limited audience. So it's very important if you develop a method to translate that to the software and we have that commitment and we put resources to it. This is something is very important for a department that if you talk about something, then you have to enable the community to pursue that path. And so I think that's very important. We also have a departmental inclusion and wellness advocate. Uh, Chidima is working with our students, uh, organizing um, events so that they're mindful about their wellness, about stress busting events. Uh, this is a joint position with epidemiology. So she also organizes a lot of joint events with epidemiology. So what is our goal? We want to produce brilliant scholars in statistics and biostatistics, but it doesn't really matter uh, if you are not happy in the end. So we really want to create a foster a community so that we have happier graduates of tomorrow. And our students are amazing. You'll meet the current students. They're the best part of a faculty life. Uh, they organize many, many events, some intellectual and some just pure fun. Uh, graduate student seminar, journal club, brown bag, 
uh, Biostatistics Student Association, STATCOM. This is our flagship organization working with nonprofit organizations. Dr. Spino is here who has been involved in the leadership of STATCOM for many years and also events on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'll just give you one project that I have now recently undertaken. It's actually to uh, showcase and catalog the careers of women who have taken research leadership role, which who are former graduates of the department in the last five years, five to 10 years actually. And you can see the different faces of leadership. And our students have been really, really remarkable in proving themselves in the outer world. And I just want to show you some of last year's graduates' career. So Fatima graduated last year, class of 2023. I just picked three uh, from this style of brilliant and powerful and empowering women. Uh, is an assistant professor of biostatistics in Boston University. Ing Ma is an assistant professor of biostatistics in Brown University, and they're all the last class. Margaret Banker, assistant professor in North Univer Northwestern University. So I think that uh, sometimes we just struggle with work-life balance and a lot of questions, but these role models, I want to showcase their, case, their uh, careers. They are doing leadership in academia, government, and industry, and this is uh, an opportunity for our current and incoming graduate students to know about their career. So uh, we have a lot of community building events, a lot of fun. Uh, we are big enough so that we can actually rent a movie theater and fill it up. So last uh, month we watched Oppenheimer together and students vote on the movie. Um, and so the last year, the previous year, it was um, everything everywhere all at once. That is really jarring movie. And so, um, and so I, 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 and we have so many events. We have uh, you know pie contest. I'm going to show you something. So. Last uh, March 14th on the pie day, we had this enormous spread of pie, and our staff are incredible. You have probably figured that out. And then we had a countdown to like Act 313, and you can see that the Three, two, one. So this was our pie drop. So so if you did not figure it out, it's just like the pug drop, the pie was dropped, and uh, one student could remember 160 places of decimal, he got a special award. So it's all the kind of like, and that's Debraj right here, right here, and his brother is Swaraj, and uh, he, they look similar. So um, they will be here today, and so Debraj congratulates him for remembering 160 places of decimal of the pie. Uh, so, but, but, so this is, I don't know, I, I don't want to do that again. Okay, so, uh, so, the, so as I said that, you know, uh, students are really, like we go, for the, for the new students, we have a retreat in Camp Storer, uh, true camping um, uh, feeling. Uh, when I came to the United States, I did not know what s'mores were till like after 15 years of my immigrant life. Uh, so I wanted everyone who is coming to know what s'mores are on their first week. So, so that's the, and, and this is a discovery which should not wait so long in your life. So I, I, I really wanted that to happen. We also have a wonderful lecture uh, sequence called Journey Lecture. We had a brilliant lecture by Dr. Kidwell yesterday, and it was so amazing, and you can see if you wanted to see a lot of baby pictures, this is your moment. And this has been a really galvanizing moment for the community because we only see people through our CVs. We do not know their childhood, what they experienced, their struggles, how they fell in love. Uh, and so all of these secrets are revealed in a journey lecture. So uh, I, I, I really love it. I think that you can go to many other departments. You are not going to find a department which is so good in terms of food, party, and skits. So we are good at skits. And this is, as you can see, me, our former chair, and a, like a seminal researcher, Rod Little, and Dr. Kidwell. And I'm going to show you, and this is on our YouTube channel. I really want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have very few followers. And I, I really, even if you don't come here, please, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel.
vaccines, but I'm not going to show you. Uh, I'm going to spare you. Please do that, like in your own time. But this is a really uh, re a skit about, like you know, talk about vaccines, and so a really serious topic, but packaged in a humorous way. And uh, and Kelly was worried about vaccinating her children in the skit, in the skit, in the skit, in the skit, <laughs> in the skit. So. So uh, when COVID came, you know, uh, so COVID-19 was a time where all of us were thinking how to contribute to the society, how to contribute to this crisis. And so um, our, our collaborators and our colleagues in the medical school were working round the clock in, um, in emergency rooms and in ICUs, saving lives, living in their basement, living in their garages. And so faculty in Biostat really um, rose to the occasion. And there were so many faculty in, involved in so many impactful projects. So you can see that. Um, and there was a lot of collaboration within the department. For example, Dr. Song's group uh, proposed this very nice cool package and uh, methodology called ESIR uh, for modeling the pandemic in Wuhan. And then our team actually borrowed that tool and wrote a very timely paper which really was influential in governing India's uh, public health policy. So this was our paper very quickly and we are all working in a short, quick uh, time around, uh, turnaround time. Uh, we also looked at not just India or China but really here in our own academic medical system where the uh, outcomes, the COVID outcomes were similar across racial ethnic subgroups. So sometimes I think that time comes when you have to forget everything and there is no choice except to work on some problems and COVID was one of them. And this was also a very important paper by, led by one of our then graduate students about how much de uh, delay in screening and cancer treatment, uh, how much that is changing the survival estimates for cancer patients. And this has been used really, really widely. These are highly cited papers and led to so many media mentions and became the department became very important in terms of the national eye, in terms of the quantitative work that we are doing for COVID. So I think I have sold the department to you. But again, if you are still um, conflicted, you're thinking whether to come here or not, then this song is going to change your mind. <laughs> so. Uh, no other department has an anthem like this, so I'm going to play, and Rod is a very talented singer. I'm not going to sing, but... My name is Rod Little, and I've been in biostatistics since 1993 when I came as the chair. I love the department so much that I even made up a song about it. Here's the first verse. We are Biostat, Michigan's where we're at, and we love all those symbols and graphs. Others think our t-tests are dull and flat, but our data's a barrel of laughs. We are Biostat, Michigan's where we're at, with our SAS and our PC3. Should old equations be forgot, Biostat is the place for me. I, uh, just like uh, Rod said, that Biostat is the place for me. I certainly have found my place in this department for the last 18 years, and I hope many of you find your place in this department, but most importantly, in the broader field of biostatistics. I cannot tell you how enthusiastic and, I, and inspired I am for our field. And so I hope you join Michigan Biostatistics but I'm so thrilled that you are interested in biostatistics. That's so important to me. I'd be happy to take any questions that you have about the program, about the future, about uh, statistics, about careers, anything. You want me to do something? Oh. Oh, oh, oh I can throw them, yeah. Kelly is a basketball th uh, player, so she will throw them. <laughs> Thank you. Come on. I love that. 
this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so you showed us your pre-COVID kind of plan, your post-COVID plan. Do you have an idea of where you want to see the department go in the next five years? So um, I think that you know, as I'm transitioning from the chair position, every chair has their own sort of vision, right? So I think that, but the vision is actually built by input from faculty and students and staff from their community. So um, the next chair will define the vision, but I definitely think that if I, as a senior faculty, can speak to that, uh, and also our community of faculty, I think we need to be a little bit bolder in terms of our integration with computer science. I think that would be very important for us as artificial intelligence and these new models are really becoming very powerful. We need to be a voice in the game. And the second thing, uh, we have been thinking a lot about this, that how to strengthen our undergraduate offerings, right? So that's also very important to us. The school has an undergraduate in public health, and there are some courses in biostatistics, but we are actually launching more courses. So that should be one part of the agenda. We also, I think that we have a long way to go. One of my marked failures have been to recruit uh, students, faculty, and staff from truly diverse backgrounds. And I think that it has to be a priority. It's not easy, but to work from grassroots level towards building the pipeline to really recruiting and fostering a cohort of truly diverse community, I think that has to be one of the priorities. These will be uh, definitely priorities. Uh, to maintain the size, right? So we have grown a lot. And with every growth comes some pain. And I think that together we have fought really hard that after the growth pain, we all stand taller, not as tall as her, but still, <laughs> like, you know, taller. Uh, so I, I, I do think that every community goes through this growth pains, this expansion pains, and how to really navigate that and still provide world-class education. For example, you know, as we grew, we have two sections of every, each of our core courses, so the classrooms are not so big. We have tutoring for the first year students. We have um, really tried to incorporate peer mentoring so that the students learn from each other. Uh, we have modified the qualifying examination. So I think that a department in agile and active, if it sort of transforms with the change, so but I would think that these will be definitely uh, priorities. Thank you. But you know, our field is changing so fast. When 2022 November, uh, all the large language models were announced, people did not foresee that what would happen. There would be a job title called prompt engineer, right? I could not really talk about that. And then there is a course on prompt engineering in Michigan School of Information. So our field is changing very fast. So we have to be agile, and you have to teach students to have those skill sets so that they can pivot to new areas that I cannot predict right now. Yes, please. Sure. This is so weird. Um, Do you want to uh, say your name and as oh, well? Sure. Yeah. yeah, my name is Eva. Um, I was wondering if your department um, collaborates with other departments in the university for research and that kind of thing. Yes, so we collaborate really, really widely. And so Michigan is, uh, University of Michigan, that's something to really think about because there are only very few universities which are so strong cross-cutting in medicine and public health, in pharmacy, in social sciences. It's really iconic um, that ISR, which is the one of the oldest survey organizations in the country and actually leads some of the nation's biggest studies, is actually in Michigan. So how many of you have used the Likert scale in terms of like, you know, putting survey numbers and so on? And so, uh, yeah, so Likert was actually a faculty in ISR. And so it's, it's really a very place of great history. And um, so with the statistics department, with the biostatistics department, bioinformatics, this is the quantitative sciences are very strong, but the clinical sciences are very strong. And so our main uh, clinical collaborations in the department actually lie in um, cancer, in kidney disease, where we have different centers in terms of coordinating data coordinating centers in terms of statistical genetics. We probably collaborate with almost every department on campus, but mostly in health. 
uh, and there are cross-cutting institutions that you should look up and three of them are Institute of Social Research where many of our faculty are engaged, Institute of Health Policy and Innovation where some of the work that we do is gets translated to policy as well as MIDAS, which is the Michigan Institute of Data Science. Faculty are really integrated into those, uh, but also in cancer, you know, in the Cancer Center leadership, I'm one of the uh, associate directors for the Cancer Center uh, in cardiovascular diseases, in pain diseases. So we have really strong footprint in the biomedical and public health. But within public health also, we have a lot of collaboration with epidemiology and environmental health where the data are getting more complex. And so uh, to answer your question that there is a lot of work and you'll see from Michaela's uh, presentation as well, to really think about climate change and environmental modeling and spatiotemporal modeling um, and how does it relate to downstream outcomes like agricultural outcomes and health outcomes, that's also a big area which is coming up where we are collaborating with many schools. Thank you. Hello. It's great to start. Um, my name is Tal, and I'd like to ask um, about your envisions for international students in the yes. department. So, uh, as I mentioned, you probably saw in my presentation that uh, I really believe in international scholarship. I came to the U.S. as an international student in 1996. And I did not know anybody, right? Like I do not have any friends, I'm not, I, I do not have any family. Uh, I feel that the academic community really was my home and helped raise me as a human, right? So uh, that's how we envision it. Um, and the moment you leave your culture, your language, your food, and step into an unknown territory, it's a courageous move. And in that moment of courage, you also see that your exploration is wide open. And this, and, and I, I strongly encourage, and I benefited a lot by stepping outside my comfort zone and making friends from different cultures and really knowing about the world. And so we believe in this community that we tr treat everybody uh, with respect, but we also try to learn about uh, our cultures. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One is that we just celebrated our Lunar New Year, a dumpling making event where everybody participates. We celebrate Diwali, we celebrate Lunar New Year, we have multicultural game nights because different countries have different games. And you know, in a biostat department, people love dreams. So you can, you can see, so that would be very attractive. And these journey lectures also showcases careers and lives of people and we serve food from the country or the place of origin. So yesterday we had special Maryland granola uh, because she is born in Maryland. So I, I, I just think that to embrace all cultures and treat everybody with respect is very important to us. Um, and I think that there is a lot of adjustment, right? Cultural adjustment, social adjustment when you uh, come to a new country and also get integrated with a new culture. Uh, there is a assimilations, there is social theory that you can belong to assimilation, separation, or integration, three types of environment. And one of the way that Chidima works with the students is to really understand one, 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 what their struggles are. So I would say that, and also your uh, seniors, form a very welcoming community in terms of the existing graduate students. So I really think that we have a lot of work to do in integrating the different cultures in a seamless way in the department. But uh, I think that I think that this is a global community of scholars. And you can see that reflected in our faculty. You can see that reflected in our students. And I'd also like to mention our summer program is one of the very few summer programs which uh, uh, accepts international applications because we have a separate, um, a separate like funding through a donor which actually, that's a priority for us because usually training grants are restricted to U.S. citizens and permanent residents. So this has always been a priority, a commitment to our students and to an individual. Other questions? You're feeling good about graduate school? Excited? Yes? Scared? Scared? Why? You can tell me why you're scared. Yes. 
because I saw like a like a very appreciable nod. So tell me why you are excited and why you are scared. Maybe everybody shares that same. Hey everyone, I'm Alex. Um, I'm excited because for one, I want to move out of Texas. That's a big one. Um, but I, I think it's the next step for me. And I love the next step. I'm nervous. I think just because. It, it sounds hard, and that's, I mean, I love a challenge, yes. but I want, I want to make sure I feel supported in the place yes. that I go to, and I'm going to be leaving a lot of people behind, Yes. and I mean, leaving Texas behind, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> also leaving, you know, friends and family, and that's yes. kind of scary to me, yeah. so didn't expect to be vulnerable, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first step, right? Like, this is a Say, this is a space which I think is safe and brave. And that's, that's very important, that we are, we do not always have to look invincible, right? We, we have our vulnerabilities, we leave our roots behind in order to pursue something bigger in life. And we can talk about international students, but all of us, many, very few of us have family nearby. We leave something to gain something and to gain that insight. And there are many places where actually graduate school or tenure faculty life, you'll say, oh, this is very hard. Let me see whether you can succeed. You have to be smart. But I do think that I can honestly vouch for this, that the moment I entered Michigan, I was a very like, you know, young parent and completely lost, like a failure of a academic at the time. Um, things change because uh, I was going through a difficult time in life, adjusting to different forces that life is about. Work is not just life. And I struggled in the beginning, but nobody made me feel that, oh, let us see whether you can succeed. It was everybody trying to help me and support me to figure out a way how to make me succeed. That is extremely important, that where people are not always judging you for your brilliance, but really supporting you to be your best. And I think that was very important to me. And I really felt that in Michigan. And it's okay to be nervous. It's, I, I, uh, I had an Italian friend, um, and he will always say that it's okay to cry. So I think that it's okay to cry. It's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be afraid of failures. That's only through which facing our fears are the way we grow. But there is a bigger pursuit of doing something really, really important with the talents that you have, making a difference. And see a room full of friends and faculty, everybody is there to support you, elevate you. Dear Professor, it, is it because we are a more combined subject, it's harder for AI to take place than pure statistics? Can you share something more with our advantages or threats to AI developing? So uh, this is a great question. So let me give you some perspective. One is that I, I do think that there will be tremendous application and integration of AI into biostatistics. Um, I do think that uh, so far it has been mainly the methods have been coming from computer science and engineering schools, but uh, I think it's soon going to see massive integration with biostatistics. I'm part of the university-wide AI resource committee, as well as um, the assistant vice president for research data strategy, and we are seeing a lot of effort. I'll just give you one example. These AI tools and large language models are really, really good in analyzing data which are multimodal. For example, um, text, mes text messages or like, you know, clinical notes, uh, voice messages, images, and all of the structured data and the unstructured data together. So for example, in analyzing electronic health record, once we can create a environment where protected health information can be securely analyzed, then we are going to see massive, massive influence in terms of data integration 
and analysis of heterogeneous multimodal data because they just have the foundation models have that flexibility of really taking different data types. If you say, I'm going to do a statistical model which has images as an object or uh, it has voice messages or clinical notes as an object, it's sort of un in, so it's not really naturally intuitive for statistical models to think like that, but I think that there are many models and AI models, I, and also we need to understand the properties of this model, evaluate this model. But I also share a lot of concern in terms of fairness and ethics of these AI models. If you think about the current AI models, their training data is coming from a very selected group of people in the world. And so if you're building your model on a very biased training data and policies and decisions are being made on that biased data and biased algorithm, then inequities are going to really reinforce themselves and we need representation in terms of the training data and then before we apply to test data all over the world or validation data all over the world. So design, how to design and evaluate these AI tools, statisticians are going to play a humongous uh, role in that and we are seeing a lot of conversations. This has already like, you know, taking uh, different professional learned societies attention and we are building forces to understand. Uh, we may be a little slow, statisticians are usually very deeply rigorous people but I think that we are going to make tremendous contribution in innovation in terms of design and evaluation of these tools. And the other thing I wanted to mention that uh, there are areas in which universities can really use these AI tools, that the areas which may have global and positive social impact. So, uh, for example, you know, uh, the application of AI to climate and sustainability the application of AI to education, the apl application of AI to human health, application of AI to poverty solutions. These are areas where I think that our existing strength can blend where probably uh, big corporations and industries are not going to invest as many resources. So AI with human-centered AI and AI for positive global impact is where I think that universities are going to make tremendous contribution. You're good? All right. Thank you so much. I have a wonderful weekend here, so that's very important. from Michele Peruzzi, who is one of our newest faculty members, um, although he's been here a year. But uh, we're so grateful to have him here today to talk. Nine months only. With us, I apologize, I was not using the microphone. Um, and so while he's bringing up slides, um, where, so we heard Texas. Who else is from somewhere far away? Do we have any California? Yeah, awesome, thank you for coming. Did anyone come internationally here today, travel overseas? No, hopefully they're online, okay, all right. Yeah, well we're so grateful that you all are here. We are so, so grateful and we hope there's lots of time to answer, to ask questions and to get answer, uh, answers to your questions. So definitely keep those coming. All right. Uh, yes, but you should use this. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Michele. I have, as, as, as you've heard, I joined this department last year. Um, so this is my first year in Michigan. And so even though I'm not going to talk necessarily about uh, why I chose Michigan, and you're going to see some of the things that motivate my research only today, I would want to second everything that Ramar said. Uh, I think Michigan is a great place to be. 
uh, and I made the choice to come here uh, because of the things that I saw in Michigan. So I urge you to consider where you're going also in terms of your quality of life. Um, and I think uh, that Michigan and Ann Arbor and the university here and the department all have uh, amazing uh, opportunities for everybody. Uh, so yeah, today uh, I am going to talk about some of the things that motivate my research and my work um, and some of the things that you would see if you took a course with me, which is currently ongoing. Uh, some of the students I think here uh, are uh, aware of that uh, and scared of me. So, uh, so yeah, I, I mostly work on spatial statistics uh, and models with Gaussian processes, uh, but the applications that I want to work on are very diverse. And so here I'm going to talk about how we can use potentially the same uh, methods to understand the dynamics of cancer in the microenvironment of the tumor, um, you know, the cell, the tissues, uh, but also when you want to diagnose the effects of climate change in the macro environment, right? So the, the earth. And, and these two things, even though they are very different from each other, actually they are pretty similar and I'm going to try to convince you and motivate you to possibly uh, do work on this. And you know, there's multiple faculty here, members that are also working on Gaussian processes and scalable Gaussian processes for very nice applications um, in, in medicine, so I urge you to also consider that there are many other things that you can do with the same uh, kind of structure. Let's see if I can, yeah, there you go. Um, so yeah, in the past, uh, just as to, to make you understand who, who's talking to you, I don't necessarily have only a background in statistics or mathematics. I come from economics, and so I'm also interested in the social aspects, but currently I'm working on those things that I was mentioning. And in my research, most recently, I've been working on Bayesian statistical methods, applications, algorithms, and software. So another thing that uh, I do is develop software packages that you can use in R, uh, open source. And some of the research questions that I have is, for example, what are the local impacts of climate change? We've been studying it uh, in, at a global level. Is there climate change? Uh, what, is what can it be attributed to? But I wanted to understand more about, so how does it affect uh, people and society locally, for example? Um, how are ecosystems changing? And some of them may change in different ways. And so maybe if you take the average, you see no change. But then if you look locally, you see many changes. Um, same thing in terms of what is the impact of poor air quality on health. Um, last year, there, you know, actually every year in parts of the US there's fires, and so people breathe in a lot of poor air uh, from smoke from those fires. How is that impacting them? Um, and also, you know, other topics such as the interaction effects on health outcomes, and the other thing that I was mentioning, how does cancer uh, affect the spatial relations between cells, right? So um, one thing that I just heard was the importance of AI methods, but what AI methods in medicine cannot do yet, I mean, they can make predictions, and frequently they're very good predictions, but can they explain why they make those predictions? And so one of the things that I want to do in my research is being able to develop mod models that can explain, can tell you, can have your, as a human, learn uh, why things are happening, right? Because that's how we move on to the next step in research, like to get new ideas, new directions. So first, let me start with uh, some, some um, climate change diagnostics, right? So this is one part of the things, and mostly what I've been working on in my past, uh, recent past. Uh, so the questions, as I was mentioning, is how do ecosystems develop in terms of climate change? Uh, what is the effect of human intervention, and so on? And so in these situations, we have multiple, like a multitude of data sources, right? So we have weather stations, you know, on the ground. We have satellite imaging that take you take pictures at regular intervals of earth we have remote sensing so, so such as lidar uh, sensors that take like depth measurements camera traps to see whether there's animals around and citizen scientists meaning just people who walk around and take notes right so many many uh, data sources and one example of this uh, uh, this kind of a set of problems is, you know, again, air quality monitoring, and so we have a weather station that measures also the quality of air. We have fires, and this is going to have impacts on human health. And so this is one uh, topic that I am interested in, but also relates to the research that I've been doing and the models that I develop. 
Um, and see, here's an example of the kind of data that you would be able to see and that my students in, in, in 696 uh, spatial statistics do see all the time. And I ask them to work on, on developing methods and fitting models for these kinds of data sets. You know, there's multiple sensors here in the Pennsylvania area, and we have like air quality levels. Um, and then you can use these to assess how people are breathing in this air and having uh, issues or non-issues for their lungs, for example. And the other uh, topic that I'm talking about here uh, is the under like trying to understand the cancer microenvironment. And so the thing that I'm saying is basically that even in this case, we have multiple sensors, right? You, you can imagine that I'm, make, I'm making a parallel with what we saw before. So here we have uh, medical imaging, such as MRI or CT imaging. We have tissue, tissue biopsies in which you take a little bit piece of, of you know, humans' tissues and then take pictures from a microscope. And we have laboratory testing in which you know, we have other sources of data. And once again, even in this case, there is a spatial aspect. As you can see here, uh, this is a completely made up image of two tissues. Um, this is AI generated. On the left, we have uh, what AI imagines as being healthy tissue, and on the right, some non-healthy tissue. And you see that the, even AI knows that the unhealthy tissue is um, different you know, from a spatial perspective relative to healthy tissue. Um, even in this case, if you look at real data, so this is now um, on the left, you see like the uh, markers of different cell types. And you see that there's a spatial um, structure in all of these uh, cell types and how they are patterned in, 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 in the tissue. And so the idea even here, just like we saw in the air quality monitoring case, is that we can use spatial methods to model these um, data and find uh, explanations for how things change and how things are and why they are that, the way that we see them. And so how do we link them? So the similarity as are, of course, that you know, we have in both cases data with spatial and temporal coordinates. Uh, the data are multivariate, so it means that at every coordinate we have multiple uh, sources of information, such as you know, multiple cell types maybe, or multiple uh, environmental variables. And in both cases we have high resolution sensors, we have massive data sets, and this is going to be a problem because many of the methods we develop are actually not very scalable, meaning that they don't, they don't extend to very large data sets. And so one topic of research that I've been interested in is in how you develop methods that do scale to massive data sets. And that's important and very influential. Uh, and we have covariate information. You can imagine like the subject information in case of medical imaging or the environmental information in case of the environment. And we have complex interactions, of course, and multimodality, as I was, I was saying, you know, uh, that just means that you have ground level data and then satellite imaging and they tell you kind of the same information but in a different way. But the differences are that we have just one planet Earth, so that is the one subject that we have in the case of the environmental uh, studies, whereas in the cancer studies we have multiple subjects. Um, and then in, in the environmental case we have observational data, whereas in, in, in medical studies we possibly may have randomized trials and so treatment effects that we want to measure, for example. And the treatment effect may be different according, you know, in space. But that's uh, not very simple to estimate. And so in all of this, what I'm saying is you can use Bayesian methods. Uh, and maybe Bayesian methods are the glue that can help you um, bridge like, these areas that look different, but actually, I'm, I'm arguing they're very similar. And in, in a Bayesian method, I'm not sure how many of you are, how many of you are familiar or have heard about Bayesian methods. Many of them. So yeah, that's yeah, very good. So we have a probability model for the data. Uh, that's like our instruments, right? So the, 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 the okay, so English as second language. I don't remember how things are called. <laughs> uh, so, speaking of international, um, yes, where you put the colors and the instrument you used to draw, okay, that. Uh, but it's not there yet, right? So we have prior uncertainty. The palette, yes, the color palette, yes, of course. Uh, and uh, the, the, what's it called? Brush. Brush. Thank you. <laughs> it was not that difficult, right? I, I, thi I think I should, I should have known. Uh, but see, I am, I'm, I'm work on other things, not, on, uh, not an artist. I mean, uh, yeah, I let I, AI do everything here. So. Um, so again, we have prior uncertainty, so kind of an idea of how things should look like before we see the data, right? And then we observe the data. We see which color we are supposed to use. 
and then we draw, like you use the uh, brush to draw whatever the um, solution is to the problem, right? So the posterior is just the uh, update, updated uncertainty that we have about model parameters that we don't know anything about, except for the prior information. So, uh, and you know, here I'm not gonna uh, go over it too much, but essentially we may have uh, uh, data for subject at some location, so you can imagine that this is potentially the pixel of an image or for, for a subject, and if, uh, if we only have Earth, then I is just Earth. And then we have the model for all subjects. We want to explain the data with some parameter that we don't know. We want to estimate that. And then that parameter can be simple, such as a number, but also a whole function, such as a surface. Right. So that is uh, when, for example, we want to estimate the effects uh, in space. That effect in space is you know, a big image. Uh, and so the prior and surfaces that we use is uh, typically a spatial stochastic process, uh, such as a Gaussian process. Uh, and so then, you know, in our Bayesian um, framework, we observe the data. So here would be the data for, for example, multiple subjects, um, I think, in the medical setting. And then we uh, update the uncertainty that we used to have, the prior, using the data and find the posterior. And you see here, basically, I'm applying the same method, right? So we have a rough idea of how the shapes should be and, you know, the, but we don't know how to color them. And then we put color on that. So that's a representation of how a, how a Bayesian uh, framework would work. And with, once we get the posterior, so the goal of a Bayesian model is to get the posterior. Once we had the posterior, we can do everything. We can do test of hypotheses. We can give you uncertainty intervals. We can make predictions. Everything we need to do is inside the posterior. So the goal is always to find the posterior. And in the um, satellite imaging case, so, for example, in this case, you have a situation in which you have snow and uh, trees, and you know that the water cycle, uh, especially with like a in a situation of climate change, is very important for not only um, you know directly to understand what the uh, effect of climate change is, but also downstream the effect on people. You can imagine in California this year they had a lot of water, but the year prior they were having no water at all. And then if there's a lot of snow accumu accumulation, then there's going to be water in the spring. If not, there's none. And so that impacts not just the local uh, you know, areas that have or do not have snow, but you know, overall society. And so in understanding those changing and making predictions is very important in the future. And here uh, we use scalable Bayesian Gaussian process regression methods to basically um, be able to analyze these massive sources, uh, massive quantities of data in this very complicated setting in which there's a multivariate outcome, and you get all of the things that I was mentioning, including uncertainty intervals and, and so on. And in the, uh, this is ongoing research now. This is in the tissue biopsy case. We have multiple subjects, and with some people who are asking about collaborations with uh, external departments. So this is a collaboration that's ongoing with the Center for uh, cancer, bioinformatics uh, at the med school. I don't remember its name. CCMB. Um, so there's a PhD student and a postdoc there that are working with me to develop this uh, software package that is basically an extension of the software that I was developing earlier for um, the environmental sciences uh, to this situation in, in which you have multiple subjects. And you want to understand how the tumor microenvironment changes uh, in time and space um, for the different stages of cancer, for example, right? So that would explain how cancer impacts cells and the relationships that they have with each other. And so this is like initial uh, steps in fitting those models and trying to understand how things work. Um, you know, again, uh, this is ongoing research. We are planning to have something out by the summer, uh, but yeah. So if you were coming to Michigan, you would expect, you know, not just with me, but of course with everybody, uh, that you can be exposed to a variety of problems and a variety of people to work with. And so I think that's very appealing. I think that's very um, advantageous for your career in the future because you can always say that you have had experience in a variety of things as opposed to just working on a narrow set of things. So again, uh, why Bayesian paradigm? This is like trying to convince you to, to, to use this, not necessarily to convince you to come to Michigan, but I, a lot of people in Michigan Bayesians, no. So it's a flexible stra strategy for complex data. It's based on the math of probability. Uh, it forces you, and my students know that it forces you, I force them, 
to make clear assumptions uh, on you know, what your prior is, what your model is. And that's always the question that I ask the students, and some of them can, can attest to that, that they need to be very accurate and specific and detailed in how they define everything, because that's the nature of a Bayesian model, to be like, very clear. Um, and again, this forces the user you know, of a software package, for example, to think about what you're doing, the science of what you're doing. It's not just about running a couple lines of code and getting the answer. You kind of need to understand what's going on because, because it's you know, complex but also flexible and it's very interpretable, so you should be taking advantage of that. And that leads to reproducible science. I mean, there's always talk about having this crisis of reproducibility that you know, uh, people run studies and then others run the same study, you know, trying to figure out exactly the same steps, and then the results don't reproduce. And so this being very transparent, very clear, that it's the nature of a Bayesian, uh, uh, a Bayesian model allows you to be, hopefully, more reproducible. And so, you know, more impactful in the longer term future. And so if you want to have like some uh, references about what I've been doing, uh, here's some. Um, that I think I'm done with the presentation today. I hope I have motivated you enough. Uh, but uh, you know, you can talk to me or anybody else um, here. I think it's going to be a very good move if you move. Thank you. Do we have questions? I hope I haven't scared you with uh, with my talk about you know courses. Yes, please. Oh, we have another. Hi. Yes. Hi, I'm Jennifer. So you explained earlier that you're doing stuff both with like the cancer stuff and the climate change, and mm -hmm. then you said for the cancer stuff you were collaborating, you know, like like in the health departments, and then for the climate change, who are you collaborating with for for the, those so, studies? Thank you for the question. So yes. Um, as I've moved the year, uh, basically my initial step was to try to establish some uh, relationship with people at Michigan, right? Because it's important to to have like uh, your foot in like multiple places, right? And so uh, and so the thing the, the first thing that I uh, that I could find was uh, actually this uh, collaboration with people at uh, the med school. Uh, I think they're at med Michigan Medicine. Computational medicine and bioinformatics. Um, and so, because they have access to data, right? So for me, the goal is to have access to important, to cool data that inspires new models. Uh, and so that's what I did. In terms of the climate change part, that's, that's, that's all of the collaborations that I had before coming to Michigan. So I have my postdoc advisors uh, are uh, part of that. I have a collaboration that was ongoing with uh, uh, George Washington University um, that was like, related to modeling the, um, I have it here, yes, uh, the, the um, changes in the speed at which trees become green during the year as a, as a consequence of climate change. Uh, and, and so that's another part. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Hi, my name is Emily Marin. Um, I have a question. You mentioned earlier something about um, it was particularly large language models, right? That you were trying to get them to be more transparent. So, I mean, I'm, yes, ask your question, please. So, um, I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah. How exactly do you propose to do that? Because I, I do a bit with large language models and some other models, but um, they're very, very not transparent at all about how they're thinking. Exactly. So, I'm wondering how you're proposing to make them uh, expose how they're coming to their conclusions aside so from probability maps. I completely agree with you that they are very obscure in how they give you the perfect answers sometimes. Right? So there's, I think there's a paper that was published recently in Nature, uh, I want to say. Uh, I think it was a group of Stanford researchers that used uh, you know, a very large data set of images and they were able to predict uh, or make predictions about cancer development using images, right? And so I, re I read that and I'm like, okay, cool. So 99% accuracy in making a prediction on your cancer stage based on images, that's very accurate, but you know, 
how did you do it, right? Uh, and so I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily easy to like, reconstruct an AI model so that it tells you exactly how it's doing those things. Because it's the nature of those models to be deep. You know? And every layer in those uh, hierarchies means that you're losing interpretability because there's like a billion parameters that all of them have like different uh, effects. So what I'm, what I'm actually saying is that we could potentially use the results of you know, those predictions, consider them as our data, and make them uh, look like noisy data, and then try to, you know, because now we have a lot more, uh, you know, the data can be, we don't have to just rely on the la human labeling of images and ca cancer stages. We can use a large language model. We can have a massive data set of images, and then we can fit a Bayesian model to those images, you know, taking into account the noisy. What did you say at the beginning? Analyzing the output and then comparing it to the input and what a human would do, and then you're kind of like interpolating. So the, the AI method, the AI, AI model is typically trying to do that, right? So you, you give it a training set, and then it's learning from whatever the human does, and it's going to do, try to, uh, to, to mimic the human as much as possible. Uh, but the human you could ask, and the AI model you, you don't, right? And so the AI model will generate, generate a ton of data, though, whereas the human would, would, would take a long time to generate the same amount of data. So now that we have a lot of data, we know the answers to this question, and it's pretty accurate. We can trust the AI model that's going to give us something that's maybe noisy, maybe not always 100% accurate, but pretty close. Uh, so that's, that's nice, and then we can just use that data and reanalyze that data and kind of try to give an explanation of why the AI, the AI model came up with those answers. And I think Bayesian methods are actually, you know, Bayesian methods, and I mean um, interpretable and flexible Bayesian methods that you can interpret and you can understand, understandable Bayesian methods. Yeah. There's a whole line of research on that. Um, can actually do that for you, right? So they can tell you, here's why the AI model gave you that answer. I think that's, that's a very potentially powerful thing that we can do. Because people are expecting that as a, you know, in the future. I think it's not just going to be limited to, oh, yeah, sure, here's the. And you can see that when you use ChatGPT, right? So sometimes it's like, OK, thank you for all of that uh, you know, cloud of text. But uh, I mean, it sounds OK, but maybe I want to have like, some input more, which is why we need prompt engineering then. So. But yeah, I hope that answered the question. All right, thank you so much, Michele. That was excellent. Okay. Graphics, just phenomenal as usual. That's AI. Thank you so much. <laughs> Prompt engineering. <laughs> so um, we are running a little bit behind schedule in usual admitted student day uh, fashion. So we're going to take a quick break now to make sure that you get to use the bathroom, stretch your legs, and come back so you can get full attention for our student research presentation. Um, and then we'll move on from there. So if um, you'd like, we'll come back at 1035, um, which is just a little under 10 minutes. There is still food in this room if you're still hungry or need a snack. Otherwise, if you go out here, turn left and left again down the hallway are bathrooms. Um, so we'll see you back at 1035. Thank you.
We don't get too far off schedule. Um, there will be plenty of time for chatting and and learning about your neighbor. So um, I don't want to. I don't want you to stop that. I do want you to stop now, but I don't want you to stop that generally. Okay. So. Um, our next presentation is from one of our uh, senior PhD students. Um, so we have the pleasure to listen to Jeff Okamoto right now, and then we'll um, go right into the admissions part. So um, thanks, Jeff. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm a PhD student here. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, some of my recent work on uh, integrating transcriptome-wide association studies and colloquialization analysis. So a uh, quick show of hands, anyone ever heard of the, either of those before? One? OK, that's more than I thought. Okay. So uh, I'm going to spend the first few minutes uh, filling you guys in on, on what exactly co-localization and transcriptome-wide association studies are. Uh, then I'll talk about my, uh, my method and qu talk about a, um, a quick real data application. So the broad research question that we're interested in here is how can we study the genetic mechanisms of, co of complex traits. Uh, you can think of a complex trait as something like your standing height or maybe like a uh, disease status. Uh, so one of the most popular ways that researchers have done this recently is called a uh, genome-wide association study, or GWAS. Um, so these allow us to see basically the SNP, lem SNP level underpinnings of a complex trait. Uh, so what's a SNP? Basically, it's just a single substitution of a nucleotide at some place in your genome. And the idea of a GWAS is basically to perform a simple uh, linear regression of your complex trait levels um, on your minor, minor allele count uh, at that SNP. Uh, and if you do that basically hundreds of thousands to millions of times across your genome, you end up with a plot like this, um, where you have basically an association for every SNP in your genome, and you have the, uh, the association strength here on the y-axis and the location uh, on the x-axis, and we call this a Manhattan plot. So the next step is basically linking these genetic associations to the genes that they influence, uh, which we call putative causal genes here. Um, and this is actually pretty challenging. Um, so traditionally, researchers have relied on our prior biological knowledge of uh, genes in proximity to those GWAS loci. Uh, so we have the same Manhattan plot here um, as the last slide, and I've revealed to you that it's a GWAS for serum testosterone levels in females. Um, and you can now see that uh, they've annotated um, the top GWAS hits based on that previous biological knowledge. So uh, fairly recently, a new class of methods has begun to emerge called uh, mechanism-aware PCG implication methods. And the idea of these methods is to take what we call multi-omics data uh, and integrate that uh, to identify PCGs and uh, reveal their underlying mechanisms. So some examples of common data types, uh, multi-omics data types that we uh, often integrate are uh, transcriptomics or gene expression um, and proteomics. Uh, and some popular methods that we use to do this uh, are called co-localization analysis and transcriptomide association studies, or TWAS. So what's a co-localization analysis? Um, so the goal here is going to be to identify, or to, sorry, to determine uh, whether genetic variants that are causal for a molecular phenotype, so gene expression, for example, and we call these variants QTLs, uh, overlap with those that are causal for your complex trait, so your GWAS trait. So here I have a little cartoon. Uh, we have SNP X, which is causal for both your gene expression of some gene, gene A, uh, and your complex trait, so this represents a colloquialization. So this is actually a fairly complicated task in practice, and I'll show you why with these two cases. Um, so case one on the left, uh, we have our true colloquialization. Meanwhile, case two on the right, we have separate uh, QTLs and GWAS hits, so we don't have a colloquialization. So it turns out that if SNP X here is uh, perfectly correlated, or in genetics lingo we say, in perfect linkage disequilibrium, or LD, with SNP Y, then these two cases are going to be indistinguishable. So in response to this problem, uh, researchers have developed Bayesian methods to try to resolve this case um, if SNP X is in weak or moderate LD with SNP Y. And basically, the idea is, is that you can quantify the uncertainty in the presence of colocalization through what's called a gene-level colocalization probability. So that was one way to link genes to your GWAS trait. 
Now I'm going to talk about another way, another way, which is called TWAS. So TWAS is a form of what's called instrumental variables or IV analysis, um, which uh, is designed to use observational data to test for causal relationships from some exposure, in this case, gene expression, to some outcome, in this case, your complex trait. So we're, in we're interested in whether or not this red arrow on this graph exists. Um, so this, uh, this form of analysis comes actually with some pretty strong assumptions because we're using observational data. Um, one of them is randomization of your uh, genetic variants. One is the relevance of your, uh, your instruments or your genetic variants to your uh, molecular trait, so just your QTL strength. And then uh, the final one, uh, which is often the most difficult to validate, uh, is the exclusion restriction, just being that your SNPs uh, can't be causal for your complex trait through any pathway other than um, the exposure that you're considering, in this case, our gene expression. So in practice, the way that you do a TWAS is you have some expression reference panel um, on the right here that you use to train a prediction model. Um, then you use those prediction weights in a separate GWAS data set to predict your expression across the transcriptome. You end up with your transcriptome-wide set of uh, predicted expression. Then you correlate all of those, uh, all of those predict predicted expressions with your GWAS trait. So you end up usually with like a transcriptome-wide set of association statistics, like a z-score. Um, so uh, just to recap a little bit here, colocalization analysis was a way to probabilistically quantify our overlap between causal QTLs and GWAS hits, often returning a colocalization probability for each gene. And TWAS was another way to link our genes to our trait. Um, this way tests an association between your predicted expression and your complex trait. Uh, and you often get a z-score as output for each gene. Um, so uh, recent work has actually found that these two types of analyses can be complementary when applied to the same data. Um, in particular, they don't always implicate the same set of genes as causal. Um, and there are certain uh, underlying biological factors that can actually explain this. Um, so uh, for example, if you have a strong co-localization but weak TWAS signal, this can indicate the presence of what's called horizontal pleiotropy. So we have here on the left uh, what horizontal pleiotropy looks like, where you don't actually have that arrow from your gene expression, your complex trait. So this is not a causal gene. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we're looking for cases like on the right where you have vertical pleiotropy, where you do have that effect. Um, and on the other hand, if you have a strong TWAS signal but weak co-localization, this can indicate what's called an LD hitchhiking effect. So in this example, you have SNFx, your, your QTL that you're using. That's uh, an LD with uh, some direct effect, direct effect SNP, SNP Y. Um, and basically, this is inducing a, a false or spurious TWAS association. Um, and you can see in this case, you don't actually have co-localization. Um, so going off of that, uh, this previous work offered a strategy to try to reduce these spurious TWAS results. Um, and the idea here was going to be to basically filter out uh, basically filter your, your TWAS results using a co-localization probability threshold. So the idea here, graphically, is going to be to superimpose co-localization evidence, and hopefully that'll get rid of cases of, of spurious, uh, where you, basically you don't have a true causal effect from your uh, gene to your trait, uh, and hopefully you'll just be left with uh, your true scenarios where there, there is an effect. Um, so the major drawback of this approach uh, is it's, it's pretty ad hoc, and you, you lose your... Uh, your, your uncertainty quantification, and your, your uh, PCG implications. OK, so now we're going to get into our methods overview. Uh, and our more focused research question now is going to be, how can we take our evidence from these two types of analyses, TWAS and co-localization, uh, and probabilistically integrate them to implicate our PCGs? So we're going to start with a model um, to motivate ourselves so that top equation uh, is for our gene expression of our target gene, our, our candidate gene. Um, and this is going to be a function of the genotype matrix G and our true EQTL effects vector beta E. Um, our bottom equation Y is for our complex trait, our GWAS trait. Um, and this is a function of our uh, true gene to trait effect, which, which is what we're interested in, uh, gamma. Um, as well as this extra G beta Y term, which represents the uh, pleiotropic effects, which are not mediated by our gene expression. So previous methods have actually also considered a similar equation. 
Um, but these impose additional assumptions to try to identify that uh, gamma term. Um, for example, they assume that one method assumes that the, the two beta vectors, beta e and beta y, are uncorrelated, uh, and another assumes that your pleiotropic effects are constant across variants. So in practice, these actually aren't very reasonable assumptions. Um, they're often violated in real data. Um, so to try to um, get around making these assumptions, we're going to focus more on testing whether gamma equals zero rather than estimating it. Um, and as sort of a launching point, we're going to note, based on this equation, that our causal EQTLs are going to have to be co-localized with GWAS hits based on this model. And basically, to, to show you that, just sub in the, the E equation into the Y equation. And you can see that genetic variants with non-zero beta E's are also going to have a GWAS effect. So our method, which we're, we're going to call integration of TWAS and co-localization, or intact, basically is going to incorporate that observation um, into an empirical Bayes framework to implicate PCGs. So a quick overview here. We're going to first form a Bayes factor from our TWAS z-score to represent uh, marginal likelihood. Then we're going to form an empirical Bayes prior uh, using our co-localization evidence. So that's going to take the form pi f of p, co p, p coloc, where p coloc is our co-localization probability. We're going to uh, estimate pi as a unconstrained TWAS prior. Uh, and the function f is going to satisfy two properties, the first being that it's monotonically increasing with our co-localization probability, and the second being that it's thresholded at some value t, just to make sure that if we have a very strong spurious TWAS signal, we don't want that to overwhelm a very small co-localization probability. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we can use Bayes' rule to form our posterior. OK, so summing up here again, um, our goal was to estimate a posterior probability of causality, essentially, for each gene. Um, we used an empirical Bayes framework to do this. That involved uh, converting a TWAS z-score to a Bayes factor. And then we also formed an empirical Bayes prior based on our co-localization evidence. Um, uh, OK, so now uh, I don't have time to show you how well our method works in simulation. Um, but uh, I'll jump into a quick real data application. Um, so this, for this application, we're going to look at four different GWAS traits. So we have serum urate IGF-1 uh, and testosterone separately, separately for males and females. Um, and the reason why we chose these traits is because we actually have a lot of biological knowledge ahead of time about these traits. So we can actually use these to see how well our method is working. Um, so these traits can be further broken down into sub-pathways, which is in the second column to the left. Uh, and each pathway is annotated with a number of core genes, or genes that we just know are relevant to these, these uh, complex traits from our prior biological knowledge. So that's annotated to the right of the pathway name. And then the middle column is going to be the number of core genes that we have implicated uh, based on the proximity plus knowledge approach. So proximity plus knowledge is just basically the approach that I talked about on one of the first slides, where uh, basically you implicate any gene that has a GWAS hit um, basically in proximity to its coding region um, in your genome. So to the right of that, we have the number of genes implicated by intact. And we're integrating uh, multi-tissue gene expression data for this, uh, for this implementation. Um, and then finally, on the right, we have um, the overlap of the core genes implicated by both approaches. Um, so what I really want to point out here is two things. Uh, first of all, we have substantial overlap between the number of, uh, between the genes of, uh, implicated by each approach. You can see that on the right. Uh, and then also, uh, there are several cases where intact implicates core genes that we miss using the standard proximity plus knowledge approach. Uh, so we're going to conclude here that uh, intact uh, is a complementary approach to the standard. OK, so just uh, wrapping up here. So uh, intact. Um, was, is basically a new method to explicitly link genes to complex traits using uh, the transcriptome. Uh, the, the main idea here was to protect against LD hitchhiking effects by constraining our TWAS results using co-localization data. Um, and then we just saw that we were able to complement the proximity plus knowledge approach. Um, and some uh, extensions that we've been working on recently are adapting intact to consider 
uh, additional molecular phenotypes, so uh, protein levels, for example, in, in addition to our expression, um, and then also to focus more on uh, trying to estimate those effects rather than just uh, testing for them. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, my advisor um, as well as our co-authors on this work. Um, and if you're interested, uh, I, I encourage you to check out our paper and our, our, our package. Uh, thanks for listening. All right. Um, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. If you have questions for Jeff, I'm going to ask that you find him um, after our uh, admissions piece so we can get moving so you can get to the faculty. But at that time, hopefully Jeff will be around and you can ask him questions or you can email him. Um, so thank you so much. So, um, welcome. I am the PhD committee com uh, admissions committee chair. My name is Kelly Kidwell. I'm also a professor here in the department um, and uh, associate chair for academic affairs. And I'm just so grateful that you all came here. So thank you so much for applying to us, for considering our program. We're so glad that you made the trip here. Um, and we hope that we can convince you that this is the right place for you. A little bit more about our department. Um, we have a very large department, both in students and in faculty, but this is really an advantage. This is an advantage for you. It's awesome for us. You don't need to know what you want to study. You come here, you start taking classes, you meet everyone, and you'll figure it out because whatever you want to do, we've got somebody here that does that, and they're an expert most likely a national, international known expert in what they're doing. Um, and so that's really one of the big, big advantages to a larger program. Also, all the students here, you get a really great pick of friends, right? There's a lot of options. So it's a really great thing to have a nice big program and a lot of research money that comes in to support a lot of awesome projects. So we had a record breaking year yet again. I've said this year after year, but somehow we keep breaking records of the number of applications. So 981 applications to our master's and PhD programs, um, split about two thirds, one third across master's, the two programs and our PhD. Um, so we've been busy. We've been reading all about you and we're so grateful that you found our program. Um, we have made 485 master's uh, acceptances. Now we do not expect that many students, FYI, okay? Don't get scared. We're not increasing our program uh, fourfold. Uh, we anticipate numbers between 60 to 80 in our uh, Biostat masters and 20 to 30 in our HDS masters, okay? And then we made 51 fully funded PhD offers and we anticipate somewhere between uh, probably 20 to, to 30 or so students. Um, so really nice cohort sizes, um, really excellent, excellent program and, and a lot of students that you'll be joining that just provide so much great information for you. Um, a little bit of background in terms of our last cohort, what sort of background they're coming from and probably most of you. Um, so we ha definitely have a lot of students coming from our, to our masters with a math or stat or biostat background. That's the largest uh, representation of backgrounds in our program. But we love all types of backgrounds, right? Diversity in terms of, um, of who you are and what you've studied really helps the, the, um, program and the science and just gives it so much more, uh, so much more to share. So we still have, we have biochem backgrounds, engineering, computer science, economics, business, and some other backgrounds um, represented. So as long as you had those three prereqs, right, we're really excited about getting you here. Our PhDs um, primarily have that math stat background. We do have a lot of PhD students from our own biostat masters um, and then coming from other master's programs or directly from undergrad, usually uh, with a math stat background or data science, some finance, obviously more a little more on the quantitative side with our PhD program. 
Um, we have our two master's programs now. So we have a master's of science in biostatistics and we have a master's of science in health data science. Um, both of these excellent, excellent programs, you had to choose one or you applied to both and you got admitted to one or both of those. Um, you know, a little bit about the difference. So biostatistics is like the traditional biostatistics, um, whereas HDS is gonna have a little bit more focus on computation. Um, we're trying to develop biostatisticians, whereas health data science is maybe more health data scientists. However, those terms are somewhat synonymous these days, so I think you could definitely call yourself a data scientist coming out of our biostat MS. Um, both of these programs, there's high, high overlap. Um, a strong foundation in statistical theory. They share most of the core courses. Um, a lot of the elective courses, so if you're in the traditional biostat, you can take elective courses from the HDS program. If you're in HDS, you can take traditional biostat courses. So really great um, you, you know, combo, uh, lots of shared, shared courses here. Um, Either of these masters could be terminal degrees and set you out into the world with an amazing career. Um, alternatively, if you want to have this as a stepping stone to a PhD here or elsewhere, uh, these are great, great degrees for that. So a lot of overlap, a little bit, just more emphasis on required classes being based on computation and big data and HDS, whereas those aren't going to be required, but they could be electives in biostatistics MS. Both programs are 48 credit hours, and they are residential here over four semesters. So we don't have classes in the summer, uh, but you will be here in the fall and what we call the winter, some people call spring. Um, it has been quite springy lately, uh, but it's gonna be your two primary semesters in two years. Three quarters of those credits are gonna be um, really biostatistics or health data science classes, um, and the other are gonna be filled with electives that can come from other disciplines. We do require three hours of an epidemiology course and a one credit or one hour of a public health course to give you that nice rounding of, of uh, pu public health, given we're in the school public health. Um, but otherwise, you can fill in your electives with courses um, from Biostat, from Statistics Department in LSNA, from Computer Science, Information um, Sciences, Engineering. A lot of our students take those courses. So once you're here at Michigan, you can take all the other Michigan classes. Um, we're really hoping, you know, to get you to be a great team member um, and, and potentially a, a really well, you know, give you all those skills so that if you want to leave with your master's, you will be ready to jump into that professional world. The biostatistics for the MS coursework includes these core courses. So these are required for all individuals going through our MS, is a series of probability theory and statistical inference, Biostat 601, 602. Uh, you'll take that your first year, fall and winter semesters. Um, and alongside of that, you'll take this uh, statistical methods or more the applied regression courses, Biostat 650, 651. Um, along with those in the fall and winter semester. We also have Biostat 653, which you'll take your second year. Um, and then it all culminates with this capstone course. So we don't have a master's thesis uh, or a master's exam. What we have is this capstone course, Biostat 699, that you take in the second semester of your second year that brings everything all together. Um, and so everything you've learned that you might be like, why did I learn this theory? What, what? In Biostat 699, they're gonna say, hey, here's a project, figure it out. And you're gonna say, oh, I need that thing. Oh, here's where it comes together. Oh, and now I see how this, how this applies to this thing, right? So it's all gonna come together and really prepare you for that next step. Um, and then we have a, a bunch of a biostat electives. So for example, like survival analysis or clinical trials um, or non-parametric statistics, uh, categorical data, your, your choice on those. Um, and then you can choose some additional electives that could be outside of biostatistics. The HDS coursework is similarly going to have that probability theory and statistical methods, those four core courses, 601, 602, 650, 651. Um, but instead of 653, uh, we require these um, uh, computing and machine learn learning courses, so 620, 625, and 626, so health data science, computing, and machine learning. Um, and then we, instead of 699, we have sort of a health data science equivalent, which is Biostat 629. And so that's gonna be very similar, bring it all together, you're gonna work on case studies, and apply all those, those methods that you've just learned. 
Um, we have a required biostat elective from a specific list for this um, degree and one specific computing elective that you must fulfill from a specific list um, for this degree and then the additional electives you can choose quite broadly. Our PhD program is typically about somewhere between uh, three to five to six years, depending on if you have your master's either from our program or a different program, or if you're coming right from undergrad, it's probably gonna take more on the five to six year span. Um, so if you're coming right from undergrad or even from another master's, usually you take our master's coursework uh, to begin. So you take that same 601, 602, 650, 651, all of those courses, you do two years of that master's coursework uh, to, as a foundation. Um, and then once you've done that, you could take our qualifying exam. Currently, that looks like one exam that's based on those four core courses, um, or maybe 699 as well. So 601, 602, 650, 651. Um, and then you have about a year left of coursework for the PhD program, um, which includes you have to take an advanced calculus class or real analysis class, um, along with a higher level statistical inference set of classes, 801, 802. Um, we require stochastic processes, um, and then you can choose additional biostat electives. Once you've passed the qualifying exam, you've completed your coursework, you're now a PhD candidate. Um, and this is really exciting. This is where you get to go around to our faculty and say, hey, are you cool enough to be my mentor, right? You get to interview us, you get to see, do you wanna work with us? Do you wanna study with us? Um, can you, can you like hang out with us enough for the next few years to do your dissertation. Um, that's that time that you decide that and you start working on that dissertation and that could take anywhere between two to four years. Um, we're really hoping that from our PhD program, we're building up your skills, your foundation, your statistical foundation um, to be a real great leader. Um, we have this new coursework that we introduced this past year. So two years ago, we started as a pilot. This last year, it's, it's uh, full-fledged. So all of our first-year students, we really suggest, highly, highly suggest that you join our classwork Biostat 611 in the fall and 612 in the winter. Um, this is a grad school and professional success skills class. So this is really gonna complement all of the statistics and the foundation that you're learning in the classroom with all of those other skills um, that how do you be how are you successful in the classroom? How are you gonna be successful on the job market? How can you communicate well? Um, how can you deal with all of the pressures that you have? Uh, this class is really just um, an amazing opportunity that we have here. It's one credit, there's no homework. Um, it's just to come one hour a week and to listen to various uh, professionals across a variety of fields uh, to help you excel as a whole person, not just as a biostatistics student. Um, so it's gonna help you survive and thrive as a biostat student, um, but then also help prepare you for internships in the summer or job opportunities. Whether you're a master's or a PhD student, um, this is an excellent, excellent class. So highly, highly recommended. Um, a little bit about our funding sources. So all PhD students are funded. Several master's students were um, offered funding, although not that many as you saw on that initial slide. Um, and if you're offered funding, what that means is that you, your tuition is fully paid for and you receive a stipend and in return, you do some work. So you either get a graduate student research assistantship, which you can see is the most of our students who are funded. Um, and so you generally work as sort of like an apprentice with a faculty member. Um, or you might be a graduate student in instructor or a teaching assistant. Um, there are less of those because we do not have an undergrad program. So you'd be helping with the um, foundational courses for the other school public health disciplines for learning biostatistics or some of our uh, some of our earlier master's level courses. Um, we also have two training grants. So we have the genome science um, training program and the cancer biostatistics training program. And so uh, several of you might have heard from um, some of the faculty who lead those programs uh, for interest in, in those uh, training grants. 
In addition, um, we have a number of tuition awards. So some of you might have been offered tuition as opposed to full funding. Uh, we gave out a quarter, I think actually this year we gave out 50% in full tuition to some uh, individuals. And so that means you don't have to do any work for us. You don't get an additional stipend, but your tuition or part of your tuition will be paid for by the department. Um, so if you weren't offered full funding, um, you can look at this uh, great guide to student funding from Michigan website. We included that in your letter. Um, and so you can potentially pursue other uh, GSRAs or GSIs in other departments if they're listed on there. You're welcome to pursue that at your, um, you know, on your own. Um, in addition, we have something called STATCOM, which isn't methods research, but it is collaborative, applied, um, uh, opportunity that you can get involved in seeing how you use statistics in the real world um, to help nonprofits. And so it's a really great opportunity. It's a volunteer opportunity, and you'll hear more about that from our students. Um, we have a course called Biostat 610, and this is where you can talk to a faculty member and see if they're willing to do this with you. It's called Readings in Biostatistics. Um, and you can just essentially have like a weekly meeting with that faculty member, start reading in some area, maybe working on a project with them. Um, and so that's not a paid position. However, you get some opportunities to do, to, to start to figure out what research might be like with someone. Um, several faculty members will hire what we call temp hourly workers. Um, and so in that case, you're not a GSRA. However, you could start to work on um, most likely a collaborative project or, or something that a, a, a faculty member has for somewhere usually around 10 hours, up to 10 hours a week. Um, and so you can have some opportunities to work uh, with someone in that way. And then the summertime is a time when our faculty will more likely hire graduate student research assistantships. Uh, you're a little bit cheaper in the summer. Um, and we, we have a little bit more time to breathe and help with uh, these projects. Um, and so once the kind of like winter, spring comes around, you can check out if any faculty have these opportunities um, and apply for those. Also, um, obviously there are many, many internships outside of University of Michigan for the summer that we highly um, uh, you know, emphasize to our students to, to apply for those. And we give lots of resources for, the, for applying for those, getting ready for those, particularly in that Biostat 611 and our amazing career services office in the School of Public Health. Our students, from the masters, from the PhD, have just amazing job opportunities. So our departmental reputation, the importance of biostatistics and health data science, uh, the strength of our students, and the strength of our alumni network, um, which is vast um, all across the world, are really, really helpful in getting our graduates into amazing positions. Um, so our students go into universities, academic research centers. They also go into government. They go into industry. They go into consultation jobs, uh, technology jobs, across all different sectors where someone might be interested in, in someone with quantitative skills. Um, we post notices of positions when we hear about them. We send them around. Um, we also host recruiters. So we had a, a job fair uh, just recently uh, at the beginning of the semester to help. Um, we also have something called the Alumni Spotlight, where we invite alumni back to give a talk about how they got to where they are, what they're doing, and then they make uh, appointments with students to chat with them. Uh, Biostat 611, as I've already harped about, really great opportunities um, given there, and then our career services office is wonderful. So here's just a little quick image of where some of our students or graduates have gone. Uh, Bramar said a few of those uh, amazing female students where they have gone. But you can see over here we have we have academic centers, we have research centers, we have technology, uh, we have pharmaceutical companies, we have software companies, right? We've got it all represented, really amazing places, you know, great jobs, um, all at the fingertips of our graduates. Um, and so you can see this is a little bit older data from 2015 to 2020, but about a third of our students from the master's program going into industry, um, not quite uh, half of them or, you know, a little like about 40 percent going to Ph.D. programs. Um, almost 20% going into research universities or hospital positions and 4% uh, going into government or nonprofit positions. 
our PhD, um, almost 60% going into industry, and industry here we're kind of lumping together, you know, like pharmaceutical technology, um, places like that. Uh, about not quite a third um, from 2015 to 2020 going into academia, 10% going into government and nonprofit positions. So. Um, just really excellent opportunities, really great spread, wide variety of opportunities where our graduates are. Okay, so the deadlines. You guys have not quite a month to make your final decision, but if you know earlier, please let us know as soon as you know. We would love to welcome you and congratulate you on your decision. We hope that it's here, but regardless of where it is, we wanna congratulate you and, and be really excited for you making that next step in biostat or statistics or whatever that step is for you. Um, once you have made that decision, it's official, um, right after every, we have that kind of information from everybody, we're gonna send out if, a position questionnaire. So if you've been accepted with funding, we're gonna send out a survey to ask what are you interested in for your funding? Are you interested in teaching? Are you interested in research? Who are you interested in, in whose research and what type of research? Um, and so we use that information and we do a, a departmental um, matching system so that we take your information, we take the faculty with funding, and we do our our best to match you and the faculty with one of their top choices. Okay, so um, that will happen in, after you've accepted, after we know the numbers um, and the funding information. Um, so the late spring and summer, you'll find out who you can work with if you're fully funded. And then we'll have our new student orientation. So the week before school starts, we like to bring you in and do all this over again, remind you, um, and make sure that you get to meet all of your fellow students and have great food and fun. Our first day of classes in the fall is August 29th. Um, so if you are a master's student and you weren't accepted with funding, which is the majority of master's students, um, you are potentially considered for departmental funding if opportunities arise. So um, if we have extra uh, teaching assistantships or research assistantships um, or tuition money, um, which you know sometimes happen that there are the few additional positions, um, then we will look at your information and we can potentially offer you one of these things. Um, also, as I said, there are these temp hourly positions. Um, however, I don't wanna get your hopes up too much, so there are potential opportunities, however, they are few. So if you are an unfunded master's student, we do want you to prepare for paying for that master's for um, all four semesters. So I just wanna leave with our shared public health values. We believe in compassion, we believe in innovation, we believe in inclusion, and we pursue impact in the School of Public Health and in the Department of Biostatistics. We are just really, really excited and incredibly, um, really just look forward to, to your um, hopeful acceptance into our program. If you have any other questions, we'll give a few minutes for questions before our faculty come in to introduce themselves. Otherwise, you can ask faculty. I have a room, so you're welcome to come ask me. Um, or you can send emails, Fatma for master's questions, Nicole for PhD questions, or I'm happy to help figure out where that question should go. So with that, are there any questions for me? Yeah, um, let me give you this. Okay, maybe August 29th was this last year. So you should definitely look at the registrar for that correct date. Thank you. Any other questions about, yeah. Um, so are there any opportunities for those uh, admitted to the PhD program coming out of just a bachelor's? Is there any opportunity to like test out of certain courses? I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat into the microphone yeah, briefly. Um, are there any opportunities for incoming PhD students without a master's to test out of some of the master's courses? Oh, okay. Yes, there is. Um, so uh, you are welcome to submit coursework um, to our program. Our curriculum committee will look at that um, and decide if you can waive out of any of our courses. I will say that the majority of um, individuals who come directly from undergraduate usually don't waive out of the courses for the PhD program. Um, it's more likely that if you came with a master's from a different program, you might be able to waive. But you should try if you, if you think that it, you could potentially do that. Yeah, let me get you the, the mic first. Hi, I was wondering if PhD students coming in without a master's actually earn the master's degree 
um, when they finish all those requirements. Nicole, do the master, do the PhD students without a master's, do they technically earn their master's? Yeah, so yes. But it's, 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 a, it's a master's degree. Yes, great. So you, you, you don't have to do that, but you can do that. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Um, if we got like a tuition paid, but we didn't get funding, does that mean we don't have to do anything if we got tuition paid? That's right. In terms of you don't have to do anything in terms of a GSRA or a GSI. That's right. Your grades up. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yes. Come, enjoy, go to classes, do well. Yes. Yes. Oh, right here. Hi, uh, this is Indra. I have a question regarding the uh, funding. Um, so when we will know we are considered for the funding? Uh, after we accepted the uh, admission or after, after F April 15th? Um, so your admissions letter would have said if you are accepted with funding. Um, so you would know right now if you are accepted with funding or not. And then you will know the specifics about the funding in the late summer um, before the fall, after we get that information from the survey. So do we have any eligibility uh, uh, basis which will be eligible for the funding or uh, how, how the process uh, is designed? Sure. So when we're looking at f uh, applications in uh, the admissions process, so the PhD is automatic funding. So anyone who accepted to our PhD, we know we're going to fund you. And then in terms of masters, very little students were offered funding. Um, and there's not a specific set of eligibility criteria, but um, you know we're we're just looking for um, those in which we think would excel and in which we think would add to our program um, and and might be able to come into a GSRA or GSI position. All right, I'm sure many of you still have many more questions. And again, you can ask these to the faculty that you meet with, or you can come meet with me. Um, but we've made our faculty wait long enough. Thank you so much for your patience, faculty. As usual, we're always behind. Um, so thank you for coming. We're going to do quick introductions of all of our faculty members. Um, and then we'll have a time period in which you can go to their rooms. So they all have assigned rooms. Um, and every 15 minutes, we're going to have a little switch up. So figure out who you want to meet, and then you'll switch to different rooms. Um, if that room is too full, go find a different faculty member and come back later, OK? We have enough time for that. So we'll start over it, here. Just one yes. more quick announcement for the people online. We will be transitioning to a student panel for the online audience um, when the faculty and students exit the room. Thank you. Uh, for faculty, if you can just introduce your name and then maybe just quickly interest. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Nick Hartman. I'm a research assistant professor. Um, a lot of my research interests are focused on survival analysis, predictive modeling, um, with a focus on health policy and kidney disease. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Kathy Spino. I'm a research professor, and um, I work with clinical trials and data coordinating centers. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jian Kang. Uh, I'm a professor of biostatistics, and uh, my research interest is in machine learning based method and with application in imaging. Hi, everyone. My name is Wei Hao, and I'm a research assistant professor. And my research uh, focuses on the mediation analysis and its uh, applications in uh, environmental health sciences and other health-related areas. Thank you. Hello, I'm Hui Zhang. I'm a faculty member in the department. I work on uh, computational statistics, bioinformatics, and uh, cancer genomics. Uh, in particular, I'm sort of in charge of the health data science program. So if you're interested, you know, have any questions regarding that program, feel free to talk to me. Hi, I'm Sebastian Zellner. I'm a professor in the department. My work is primarily in statistical genetics and population genetics. I'm also the co-director of Precision Health at the University of Michigan. 
Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, my name is Xiang Zhou. I'm a professor in um, biostatistics. I mostly work on machine learning for genomics. Hi, I'm Jean Morrison. I'm an assistant professor. I work on statistical genetics and causal inference. Um, maybe we should get yep. Michele before we get all the way to the end. Just so that Oh, you I give it all. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I am Dong Lin. Uh, I'm professor in the department, so I work on machine learning, precision medicine, and the survival analysis as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Sam, I'm the uh, professor of the department, and I primarily work in a smart house uh, using wearable devices to understand uh, digital features to guide our uh, behaviors or nutrition and other aspects of your lifestyle. And so I extensively work with people from nutritional sciences, environmental sciences, and nephrology. Thanks. Hi, I'm Phil Boonster. I'm an associate professor. Uh, I'm interested in data integration problems and applications in cancer and ECMO. Hi, I'm Jeremy Taylor. I'm not in your book. I'm substituting for Fan Boo. So if you're looking for Fan, you have to talk to me. Sorry. Um, so I'm Jeremy Taylor. I work in survival analysis, longitudinal data, uh, missing data, a lot of cancer applications. And I don't know if anyone did BDSI here in previous years. Anyway, you possibly came to my backyard for a, a picnic. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Zawistowski. I'm a clinical associate professor in the department. I work in statistical genetics, population genetics, and epigenomics. Hello, everyone. I'm Moshumi Banerjee. I'm a research professor in the department. My areas of interest are predictive modeling, survival analysis, correlated data methods with applications to health policy and outcomes research, and specifically in cancer and pediatric heart disease. Uh, many of the um, Faces here, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to put uh, faces to names. I serve as chair of the master's admissions committee. So if you have questions, feel free to come and talk to me. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Elliott, professor of biostatistics and research professor at the Survey Research Center at the Institute for Social Research. Uh, I have a lot of interest in survey statistics, uh, causal inference, longitudinal data. Um, work in a huge variety of, of various applications that have some degree of relation to those topics. But nice to meet you all. Uh, hi, my name is Yi Li, and I'm working in cancer research. Nice to meet you, everybody here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vira Baladandi Yudabani. I'm a professor of biostatistics here. My research is mostly in Bayesian modeling and machine learning with applications to genomics, cancer genomics, and imaging. I also direct the cancer data science uh, unit here on campus with a look, with a cancer center here, and yep. Thanks. Hi everybody. I'm Mike Benke. I'm the longest serving faculty member here in biostatistics. I lead our Center for Statistical Genetics and Genome Science training program. I am thrilled to see all of you here today. Welcome, and I look forward to talking with some of you during the meetings from 12, 11 to 1, and also at lunch after that. Hi, I'm Nicole Fennick. I'm not a faculty member. I am a staff member. I've been here for 17 years, and I help with the admissions and recruitment area. Um, I hope that uh, you found everything all right. And as we trans transition to the faculty meetings, um, as we exit, we'll be giving you maps to the locations of the different faculty. Um, you also have room numbers on there, but I'm fairly certain you don't know what those numbers mean. So we have maps. Um, and we'll be handing them out here. So, uh, and the faculty, do you know where you are? <laughs> we'll help you get there, too. Okay. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Um, to all of you that are online, my name is Mike. I am a third-year PhD student in the department. Um, and hi, I'm, Rona. I'm Hannah. I'm also a third-year student in the department, first-year PhD, completed my master's here in April of this year. Um, today, we're going to talk to you about student life, Ann Arbor, stuff like that. And then after that, we're going to move to a student panel where you guys can ask us questions about our experience here or anything you guys are wondering about Ann Arbor or Michigan biostats. Um, so to start, we are the Department of Biostatistics. Um, we are within the School of Public Health here at Michigan. Um, and then within that, we are in, within the college town of Ann Arbor. Um, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, Ann Arbor is a really awesome college town to live in. It's a really awesome place to be a young person. Um, and the big University of Michigan gets a little bit smaller within the Department of Biostats and within the School of Public Health as well. So it's a great way to make your community a little smaller as you work your way in on this little Venn diagram. Yeah, and as Hannah said, uh, one of the cool things about Ann Arbor is that we are a college town. We have a lot of you know young people keep coming in, young college from like all the departments across the University of Michigan. Um, so it's a really lively town for you to live in. Um, next, we'll be talking about our department. Um, I'm sure you've seen from the previous presentations that we are a larger department. Um, currently for this year, we have 259 students, 124 staff members, uh, 48 full-time faculty, and we have over 2,000 alumni. Um, and then I'll also add that the Michigan Alumni Network is really strong. So this is a really awesome place to talk to people if you're looking for internships or jobs and things like that. We just have a lot of really, because of this big department, we have people going all over the place. Um, so not only while you're in this department, but then also people who have gone through it as well are great resources to you. Uh, here on the slide, we have a bunch of the student resources and other student activities that are involved with our department. Um, we have a bunch of academic support. There's um, library resources, general resources from Michigan. Um, our department facilitates first-year study groups for the student. So as you come here, um, for the, while you tackle your first-year master's co coursework, you'll be doing um, study groups, uh, which are voluntary, uh, voluntary, like you don't necessarily have to do them. But I strongly encourage you to do some study groups. Um, it's a great way to meet students. It's a great way to understand the coursework better. Um, there are groups that are led by a course facilitator who is a senior PhD student. Um, there's, we have a wellness and inclusion advocate. Her name is Chidima. Um, she enhances and improves the student experience through activities that promote well-being in a multicultural community. Um, Chidima hosts Multicultural Food and Game Night, which is where students bring food and culture uh, and games from their background. Um, and it's just like one night in the department where everyone gets together and talks about you know, what's going on in their life. And you can play games, eat food, and stuff like that. Uh, we have some great computing support from our department, um, such as from Mike, who is one of our R software developers. Um, he helps students to write R packages. Um, he helps them to you know, understand R for the homework and stuff like that. Um, and they, he hosts a workshop, and there's just a bunch of software development support and stuff like that. Um, community engagement, uh, we are engaged in the community. I'll let you talk about Stackcom. <laughs> Cool, yeah, so I am a co-president of Stackcom, so I am biased, I think it's really cool, but it's a really great program that you can get involved with where you get to, um, as a grad student, you get to work with community partners, Stackcom stands for statistics in the community, um, and it's a great way for you to get your hands on some real world messy data, um, because the ones you see in your classes are all pretty curated, um, and it's a volunteer situation where we create groups of students to work with a community partner, um, and then you get that real hands on data experience with the analysis, anything after the data collection phase. And we have some really awesome community partners. We work with people around the Ann Arbor, Detroit area, into Chicago. We have some partners in northern um, Ohio as well. Um, and it's a really awesome program, a great way to get involved with some real life research type things. Um, and then also with community engagement, we also have lots of other groups you can get involved with, one of which is the Biostats Student Association, or BSA. Um, they're a group of Biostat students who put on events throughout the semester. Um, some favorite ones that I've um, participated in, they have therapy dogs they bring in near finals, which is really awesome. We've had some um, events where we've gone out and gone to the Creature Conservancy, which is something in Ann Arbor with a bunch of exotic animals around here, which is cool. Um, and lots of ways to just connect with other people in biostats outside of the, the work and school environment. Um, and we have other, um, also ways you can get involved in the department, things like peer mentoring committee, um, curriculum committee, and ways you can offer effort to the apartment um, in a really cool way to get involved right away.
Oh, yeah, that's the next thing. Departmental committees. Yeah, so I'm involved in the peer mentoring committee, which is really great. You get to, um, as a second year student and beyond, you get to partner with the first year students um, as a mentor, which is really great. And then also that means for you as first years, you get a mentor student right away, somebody who's gone through exactly what you're going through. Um, and they are a great resource to ask questions about, you know, which electives might make sense based on your interests, how to, um, you know, navigate the transition to grad school, even silly things like where do I go find this kind of food in Ann Arbor. So it's a really great resource right away when you start here um, in Biostat to make that, again, maybe potentially big seeming department a little bit smaller right away. Yeah, I myself, um, I'm on the student recruitment and the health data science committees. Uh, I'm also a student representative at the faculty meeting. So we're a very democratic, uh, democratic department where there's like a lot of say from the students and given that we're such a big department um, I think specifically our chair Abramar has made a concerted effort to give the students a voice which I think is really great. Um, lastly on this slide um, there's always seminars workshop and faculty and student interactions um, again because we're at the big department uh, the leadership here has made a concerted effort to make sure students and faculty are getting to know each other in smaller settings outside the classroom um, so that includes things like BFF time um, there's a weekly seminar with speakers from all over the world, which you can learn more about research in different research areas. Um, the graduate student working group, which is where a graduate student will present their research for one night, and there's only graduate students allowed in the audience, so it's a kind of cool way to show your research without, you know, pressure from faculty asking you super hard questions or stuff like that. Um, and there's also faculty lunches, which are once a semester, so twice a year, uh, where you get like an Excel sheet of like all the faculty in the department who signed up to do this, um, they pick a restaurant and they take a group of like five to six students out to the restaurant. And that's a great way to know the faculty on a more personal level and also a great way to have some lunch on the department's money. Um, given that we are graduate students, um, we of course are going to advertise the ones that are free food. As you might have been wondering why some of them were bold and italicized and that's why. Um, next, we're going to talk about SPH. Um, there's, we're, there's 40 research centers and initiatives within the School of Public Health, as well as more than 40 student organizations. Um, there's the Career Development Center and the Writing Lab, which are resources provided by the School of Public Health. Uh, and these are great resources that you can use. I know the Writing Lab, um, they help with everything from your capstone course with 699. They can help you write your papers for that course. They help you with your dissertation, um, anything like that. And then the Career Center help you with your um, cover letters and your resume and stuff like that, as well as connecting you to internships and potential jobs. Uh, um, yeah, so this, this slide is a little bit more about broadly the University of Michigan and the really awesome things that we have available to us as a bigger institution. Um, so as you can see here on the left, um, this is a picture of the big house and you know, I'm sure you've heard about Michigan football. We just won the national championship. It's a really exciting place. Um, and so we have really awesome things to do in the community. We have, you know, lots of sports events. We have musical theater. We have concerts, all sorts of things put on by the institution, which is really great. Um, and again, um, we are a really top-rated university. We're consistently ranked in the top um, just as a university um, as a whole, but also Ann Arbor is ranked consistently as a really great place to live. So all these things together really bring a lot of opportunities for you to get involved. There's lots of things to do. Um, and beyond that, there are also just again, with the university, we have three different gyms on campus, so you have ways to be active um, in three different areas. There's one that's under renovation really close to SPH right now, which should be finished I want to say in the next two years or something. So lots of really exciting things coming there. Um, and also we have a lot of really awesome resources, things like CAPS for mental health resources available to students at the university. Um, and our university health service is also available to students and really close to SPH, it's walking distance. Yeah, as well, um, again, Michigan's a big school. Um, we're a big department in a big school and a big university. Um, so there's a bunch of intramural sports and stuff like that. Um, Michigan has its own Quidditch team if you're a fan of Harry Potter. Um, and I do also mention that one of the gyms is completely under renovation, as Hannah said. They completely knocked it down. They're putting up a new one. Um, but instead, in the meantime, the university put up like this big, inf this like big insulated tent um, on one of the fields as like a temporary gym that you can use. So we do have three gym facilities, um, and as long as you have your M card and you're currently enrolled as a student, you have access to them. Yeah, 
so going back to again Ann Arbor being a great place to live um, one thing I'll note you know people ask a lot of, about the weather <laughs> um, I think the most important thing to have is a warm coat and some waterproof boots because even though you know people talk about the winter I think it's less about um, you know the snow it's more about the snow melting so make sure you have some waterproof boots that's important to have um, and also uh, we are really close to Detroit and also the uh, DTW, the airport. It's only a 30-minute ride, which is really easy. We have the Michigan Flyer bus that is, I think, $15 to get a ticket to the airport. So it's really easy to, if you're from farther away, to get back home. Detroit is a hub. It's pretty easy. I live, um, I'm from the West Coast area, and it's really easy for me to find a flight home, which I really appreciate being further from home. Um, and there are also, we have an Amtrak station that's really close um, to the downtown area as well. You can get buses and trains to Chicago pretty easily and, and other cities in the surrounding area. So it's a pretty trans, um, it's a really interconnected city as well. Yeah, I definitely echo everything Hannah says being, you know, close to Detroit um, airport is really convenient. And they have the Michigan Flyer, which is a bus you can take for like 10, 15 bucks to go there, which is amazing. Um, I do want to talk about our public transportation system. Um, so as a University of Michigan student with your M card, you have access to not only the Michigan buses, but the Ann Arbor buses as a whole. So you can really get around Ann Arbor and some areas of Ypsilanti um, for free with your M card, which is really great. Um, so lastly, we have these pictures. Um, we really want to emphasize here as students the culture in our department that we have. Our department really has made a strong effort to build community and our department has so many events that you can attend. Um, here we have the Christmas party, we have our fall picnic, um, typically on Valentine's Day they have um, a dumpling making section which you can see up here um, which is really cool. We have ice skating in the winter. Uh, when the weather gets a little warmer we have our Biostat versus Epi Cornhole Tournament. Um, we are the current champions. Um, if you want to help us keep that up feel free to come here if you go to Cornhole. Uh, we have movie night, um, graduation, and of course, um, we're a strong research institution, so before students graduate, they put together like a senior research showcase uh, where students get a chance to talk about their dissertations and you can come learn about them. Um, that's all that we have for our slides. Now I want to get to the more important part, which is answering your questions, uh, which we'd be happy to do. Um, Yeah. Because there is no very detailed employment report on the official website. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the question, I'll repeat it, is that um, what career resources are there for people that want to do terminal masters and don't necessarily want to do a PhD? Um, so definitely a lot of our students go on to the PhD, but we have plenty of students that go on to a job after they do the masters. Um, I would say for the I would actually maybe say that the alumni network is maybe even more important than career resource services. Uh, we have 2,000 alumni out there that um, are familiar with our department. They know our department puts students through rigorous training and they produce good biostatisticians. Um, we have many students that get internships after their first year of their master's and then they get a job. After that, typically for the internships, some of them just apply themselves and you know we get scooped up really easily because of our Michigan brand and stuff like that. Um, do you anything to that? Yeah, I'll also say that, so Michigan, we send students all over the place. We have, just thinking of our cohort of people who left after the masters, we have people that went to um, Indianapolis, to Baltimore, to Boston, um, just the top of my head, those are the examples that I have, Chicago. So we send people all over the place, so again, that network is really important. Um, and in addition to, as well, the career services, we also get lots of emails, again, from the alumni who have graduated from this department that say, hey, we're looking to hire, we'd love to have one of your students. Um, so we also just get lots of emails of opportunities as well, and it's definitely something that I would recommend taking advantage of. And all, I think, of my friends who had internships between their first and second year of the master's ended up getting jobs with those same companies as well after the 
disasters was done. Um, so it is a really strong pipeline, and I would recommend taking advantage of it. Definitely. And this question also mentions um, a lack of um, official like report for that. So I mean, this is obviously anecdotal evidence, but some of the master students that I know that left, they went to things like Veterans Affairs. One of them went is a data scientist at Reddit. Um, Eli Lilly's a big one. We have multiple graduates go there each year, which is in D Indiana. Um, AbV is another one. And our tips, master students typically don't have problems getting jobs. Yeah, yeah, we also had two people from our cohort go to work at Harvard as a biostatistician, as a researcher. So again, just a wide range of things. And Nicole, do we have, I thought we did have a, a report of some kind. Maybe I'm... I feel like there might be something online as well. So I would I would look. I'm pretty sure that Michigan has a pretty good outline of where biostats grads go. So I would look into that again because I swear I have seen it before. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's another really important question. Um, I'll start. So obviously, if you have a funding offer from our department, uh, that's great. If you don't, some students take out loans, kind of like undergrads, the same thing. Um, there's one thing that I do want to mention that maybe you haven't heard of yet in these presentations. Um, it's called a Rackham cost sharing. Um, so you yourself um, can apply for external fellowships. Um, that would be like your own initiative um, to apply for them. And then if you're awarded one, depending on the award that you received, um, Rockham Graduate School can match some of that um, funding offer. Um, for example, like if you have a certain offer from the NSF or whatever, um, and it doesn't completely co cover your tuition, Rockham might cover the other half. Or if they, you have a tuition offer but you don't have health insurance, um, Rockham can provide that for you. Um, so. The specific details are online. It's called the Rockham Cost Sharing, but that's another way that students have funded their own degree. And I'll also mention that if you don't have a funding offer from Biostats as like, you know, a GSI or a GSRA, you can also look for those in other departments. That is something you certainly can do. I have friends that found a particular thing I would recommend is teaching statistics classes in non-statistics departments, um, because oftentimes those students in those departments don't want to teach those classes <laughs> because those aren't though their areas of interest. So that would be a really good place to start, look for the positions, or, or you can do something in a, as a GSI that a graduate student instructor, in case that wasn't clear, um, in an area that you're comfortable with that's not statistics. So I had a friend teach a language, like a GSI for a language class, just because she was a double major coming through, and that's just what she Thought would work for her. So you're not restricted again by looking just for funding within biostats as well. That's the benefit of having, you know, that big large research institution institution at your disposal. Um, so the question talks about um, competition for resources and stuff like that, given the department size. Um, I would say for the master's program, we do have a um, competitive nature among the students, particularly for spots in the PhD program. Um, I would say if you're a terminal master's student, um, you're obviously there is kind of there is a competitive environment, but I would say I wouldn't necessarily say personally that there's competition for resources outside of that. Things like the writing lab or the resources or jobs or internship or stuff like that. I wouldn't, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think a lot of the competition that um, this might be referencing is just people who are interested in getting the PhD after the master's. Terminal master's students, it doesn't really affect them so much. And then people who are direct admit PhD, it doesn't really affect them as well. Um, and there's certainly, again, it's a big research institution, so there are lots of resources available to you. Um, so yeah, I, just taking advantage of those things, even just outside this department as well. I think a lot of people overlook those resources as well. Yeah, so the second half of the question about department culture. Um, I would say interactions with the faculty, I've only had positive ones. We're on a first name basis, which is really nice. You know, all the faculty are obviously like world around researchers in their field, but um, I would actually say my favorite aspect of them is like when I just get to meet with them at lunch and stuff and they talk about and they brag about their children and stuff like that. I think that's one of the most important things that we have in our department. Um, but I do think that the person that asked this question talked about the competition. I think it's important 
to emphasize that there are many master students in our department that are competing for spots for the PhD program, and that's probably where you've heard the competition part come from, and it's pretty accurate. Yeah, and, I, and going back to that culture comment too, I, I think the really cool thing, as Mike was alluding to, all the professors here are people, which I really enjoy and I was really surprised by coming to such a big institution. Um, so the faculty are really awesome to talk to one-on-one. -on -one. And also I would say the students that we attract tend to also be really kind, people-focused people. I think that's a mixture of the fact that we're a biostats department, which is pretty grounded in those applications and people. But also I think Michigan, just as a place and as an institution, um, they tend to attract really people-focused people as well. You know, you breed what you, um, what you put out. So I think we do a really good job with that. Yeah, and maybe I should re-articulate there is competition among master students, but there's no like real like none of the master students here are like nasty about it. Every like I would say it mostly um, encourages like stress among the students. It doesn't really like no one here is like mean and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, why did you pick Michigan State University over Michigan Graduate School? And is there anything you would change about the department or your experience at Michigan? Can we go first? There you go. Yeah, sure, I can go this time. So um, I, when I was applying to grad schools, I applied quite literally all over the country. Um, so Michigan wasn't particularly on my radar when I first reached out. I actually almost didn't apply because I didn't think I would get in. Um, and every interaction that I had with Michigan was incredibly positive. So that made a really big difference to me. I went to a smaller liberal arts school for undergrad, and I really wanted to make sure that where I went for grad school, I would be supported. And Michigan really really came through on that for me. Um, I got a call, phone call when I was admitted from the person that I mentioned in my essay that I wanted to work with saying, hi, we'd really like to offer you a position in our program. Like that really meant a lot to me. Um, I also, for you know, full transparency, I was offered a fully funded position, which did make a big difference for me. But apart from that, I compared to the other universities, I was really seriously considering Michigan by far and away made me feel the most valued as a person, which was really important to me. Yeah, I echo a lot of things Hannah just said. Um, personally, my research interest is statistical genetics, um, and this is a really strong department for that, so that's one of the reasons that I came here. Um, another one of the reasons is, again, as Hannah said, everyone that I interacted with um, made me feel supported and made me feel like that, like my concerns and questions were important. Uh, and to me, that was really important. Um, you know, this is a big department, so having your small little niche of faculty and students that you know is really important to uh, you know, make your experience that much better. Yeah, and I'll also say Michigan is a great place to go if you don't know exactly what you want to work on yet because we have such a wide variety of faculty working on so many different things. Um, I thought I knew what I wanted to do when I got here, and I figured out once I got here that wasn't exactly what <laughs> I was looking for. And it was really easy for me to pivot and start working with somebody else on something that I better enjoyed. I think the second half of that question is what we would change about the department. Um, if I had to pick one thing, I would probably, I would say our department has kind of a traditional slash old school approach to coursework. Um, I wouldn't say that the coursework itself is like out of date, but I would say a lot of the faculty here really emphasize coursework, um, maybe a little too much. I think when you think about your graduate school education, you should, you know, think about like what you want to do when you go there. Um, I would say, you know, at some research, at some places, um, they train their junior students by getting them involved with research kind of right away and the courses are less important and you're prepared for your future your dissertation you know with that research experience um, here I would say the faculty really prepare you for the dissertation with their coursework or at least that's their attitude for it um, I would say a benefit of that is I would probably presume that the instructional quality here is more important or is better than it is other places just because our faculty place a stronger e emphasis on coursework in general um, but I think our department kind of finding more of a balance between coursework and research, especially for junior students, would be beneficial. Uh, yeah, and one thing I, I think I was surprised by coming here, I don't know if this is necessarily that I would change or could change, but I was a little bit surprised that Biostat felt a little bit separated from the School of Public Health. Um, so there are certainly opportunities for you to get involved in other ways in the department, you know, like with the um, groups that we've mentioned earlier that are SPH groups rather than Biostat groups or Michigan groups. Um, but I was really surprised by how separated we felt as a department. Um, and I do think the department, again, is a really good support network on its own, um, but I anticipated there would have been more crossover than there is. I 
I can start on this one. So um, we have a lot of statistics and biostat students taking classes across those two departments. So for example, I took a Bayesian stats class in stats, and I have a friend in stats who is taking causal inference right now with me in biostat. So there's a lot of flexibility in you know, going back and forth, which opens opportunities to take more classes, frankly, um, which I enjoy. Um, in terms of like what you get out of each degree, the core classes for both stats and biostats are cross-listed. So the courses teach you effectively the exact same thing. Um, it's just that you're getting, you know, different professors maybe teaching these classes, and in biostats, generally speaking, all of our applications are in public health or healthcare, um, which really, when it comes down to it, is really the only big nuance difference. Um, with the additional piece that maybe um, we have a couple classes in biostats that STAT doesn't have, which would be clinical trials and uh, survival analysis, because those are pretty biostats focused things. But otherwise, just as a, you know, looking at those core courses and your outcomes as a grad student afterwards, um, you can go get exactly the same jobs. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I'd also say our department's probably more interdisciplinary than theirs in terms of like the collaborations that we have. Again, as Hannah said, all of our applications are pretty much in human health. So we have departments with like, we have collaborations with like genetics and epidemiology and all the school public health courses in Michigan Medicine and the Rural Cancer Center. Um, and I would probably say on average, when it comes to courses, particularly the ones after the core courses, the upper lectures are probably more applied on average. I would assume their courses and for like the doctoral degree and stuff like that is probably more dependent on like measure theory and theory and stuff like that, we might be a little more applied. Adding to, adding on to the question regarding competition, how about competition for certain labs? Um, I, so the question's about competition for certain labs within the department. Um, I think based off the way that our department funds students, um, you will be matched to a professor. Um, I don't necessarily know if there's competition among labs because you typically don't have, like there's not too much fighting for spots because I think the department kind of decides it for you, right? Yeah, and, and I'll also say that just because if you want to work with someone and they don't have funding for you, you can always work with them for credit. That is certainly an option. Um, like right now, I'm working with my dissertation advisor and she doesn't have funding for me yet, so I'm teaching for my funding instead. So. And I have a friend who, in the master's, wasn't funded but still wanted to work with this particular individual, and he just took it for credit. It's like an independent study. So there are definitely avenues where you can work with who you want to. You just may not get funding directly from that source, if that's the question about resources. Yeah, and I'll also mention that if you're interested in the PhD, um, y y you can do a dissertation with someone and have them and not be funded by them. And you could do your GSRA or GSI, as Hannah does with someone else. Um, so if faculty have the bandwidth to take you on, they still can't, even if they can't necessarily fund you. So I wouldn't say there's too much competition among labs, right? Do master's students commonly have opportunities to engage in research projects with faculty members that do not involve a research assistantship? E yes, those have to be sought out. They're not going to be just given to you. <laughs> But they are certainly possible. Um, I have friends who sometimes certain courses that you take, like I think in particular six, 620 maybe, the health big data class taught by Peter Song. I have a couple friends who did, um, you do a project in that class all semester. And some of them were really excited about what they worked on. And so then they just kept working on it and ended up publishing it later. So there are certainly opportunities available to you. You just have to seek them out because they aren't just going to plop in your lap. You know, as you mentioned, you can do research for credit, right? Mm. Yes, and you can do research for credit as an independent study. That is certainly an option as well. And I'll also go back to StatCom. I'll plug that again. That's a really great, it's not a research opportunity necessarily, but it's a great way to, again, get involved with some messy real life data in a way that research might be doing. Yeah, and as Hannah said, these are things you probably have to seek out yourself, which is important. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're here to help. You have a big decision to make picking your graduate institution. Um, it's a big financial and time commitment, so you deserve all the information you have. So my biggest advice to you is just don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions, even candid questions or contentious questions. 
Yeah, and you can find both of our emails on the admissions ambassadors page for SPH as well. So that's also, you feel free to reach out to me afterwards or Mike afterwards. Um, we're happy to talk to you. And I, I do think that in this decision process, in any institution you're applying to, I think the most important thing is to talk to students because they will be honest with you. <laughs> so reach out, ask those questions, um, and figure out, you know, what, what's the vibe that fits you really well. And I should probably introduce myself. I'm Nicole Fennick. I'm the academic program manager, which means I basically lead student services within the department. Um, and I want to thank you for attending. And I want to re-emphasize, please reach out if you have any questions. Um, we will be sending a survey. And in that survey, you'll be able to list your name and preferences if you would like to be contacted for further information. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you, and I hope we will see you in late August, <laughs> which gets earlier and earlier. And go blue. Thank you.